Welcome everyone to the Connecticut Rates Workshop, Building Better Water Rates in an Uncertain World. Um, my name is Mary Ann Dickinson. I'm with the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and we have a, a little bit of um, webinar logistics for you before we uh, go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, so um, let me just go through how we're setting this up. Uh, this workshop, as you know, will run each day from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, uh, and we have allowed time for questions. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. If you're hearing my voice, you've figured out the audio, it's either through your telephone or your computer microphone and speakers, um, one or the other, that way you'll avoid hearing uh, feedback. And we, you need to know that the audio and phone line are muted at your end during the workshop because we're recording the workshop both days and, and lots of background noises make the recording uh, rather uh, difficult to listen to. So we mute everyone so that the recording will be a clean recording of the speakers. But that doesn't mean we don't want you to participate. We very much miss the fact that we're not doing this in person with the ability to interact with each other. So in this virtual format, we're doing the best we can. Um, and what we'd like you to do is, as you think of questions for the speakers, uh, you can type them in throughout the workshop in the Q&A box that's in the GoToWebinar uh, system. And the way you access that Q&A box is look in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. There's a uh, orange rectangle with a white arrow. When you open that up, you'll see that there, there is a, a Q&A area where you can enter your question. And so we just ask that you indicate which speaker your question is for. And... Um, then we will make sure to direct that question to the speaker. Uh, we will be reading all the questions that have been submitted at the end of the day, and we will we will keep going until we answer all the questions. So we're we're very happy to have you uh, participate with us uh, that way. So at this point, I'd like to um, to introduce uh, Jack Betkowski, um, Vice Chairman of the Connecticut Public Utilities Regulatory Authority, Pura. Uh, as you all know, he has served on Connecticut's Utility Regulatory Authority since 1997, when he was first named a commissioner of the Department of Public Utility Control. He was elected vice chairman of that body in 2007. And when Pura was established on July 1, 2011, as the state's new regulatory authority, Jack was appointed a director by Governor Daniel Malloy and elected as vice chairman of the new authority. He is the former president of the New England Conference of Public Utility Commissioners and is the former president of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, NARUC. Uh, in addition to his uh, NARUC and, and uh, New England um, Public Utilities Commissioner responsibilities, Jack is currently the chairman of the Connecticut Water Planning Council. Uh, where he, along with his colleagues in the Water Planning Council, led the effort to develop the state of Connecticut's first comprehensive state water plan. The plan was approved by the state legislature in the 2019 session. He's also a former member of the American Waterworks Association Research Foundation's Public Council on Drinking Water Research and was a member of the EPA National Drinking Water Advisory Council, serving on its water security working group. So, Jack, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Marianne, and welcome to everyone for this Better Building Water Rates in an Uncertain World workshop. We're thrilled to have everyone here this morning. It's going to be an exciting two days. And I'm also welcoming you on behalf of my colleagues on the Water Planning Council, Lori Matthew from the Department of Public Health, who you'll hear from a little bit later, Martin Hepp from the Office of Policy Management, and Graham Stevens from the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. It's my pleasure to serve with them. In developing the state water plan, efficiency in the water world and conservation was an important water resource topic. But we knew that reducing demand meant reducing water sales, and that would have an impact on all Connecticut water utilities. Thanks to a grant from the Connecticut Water Company, the Water Planning Council was able to secure the assistance of the Alliance for Water Efficiency to help address this issue. And I have to at this point also recognize the efforts of our implementation work group on the Water Planning Council, who's headed up by Virginia DeLima and Dave Ratka and Alicia Sharma and Josh 
uh, Cancer, who are co-chairs of the Water Planning Council Advisor Group, and their members who were really, really very helpful in putting together this program today. And I want to thank them on behalf of the council. This problem of revenue stability is not unique to Connecticut. It is a nationwide problem as per capita water use has been declining. AWE has done nine rate workshops like this all over the country, including one in 2018 in our neighboring state of Massachusetts. Unfortunately, with the COVID pandemic, we are not able to do the one day in-person workshop that AWE normally does. But nonetheless, in this virtual format, we are thrilled that we still have over 100 people who have registered for this workshop today. We're very excited about that. You know, it's interesting, a year ago, we were talking about this workshop and we were praying to God that we could do it in person. We're getting close to the end of this terrible pandemic, but nonetheless, we have to do it virtual. So I thank you on behalf of the council for joining us today. I'm pleased to be the master of ceremonies, introducing the speakers to you both today and tomorrow. And note, please, as Marianne said, we will hold all speaker questions until the end of the day during the question and answer period. And as Mary Ann described, you can type your questions into the Q&A box and go to webinar. Now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker for the day, my good friend and colleague, Lori Matthew from the Department of Public Health and also a co-member of the Water Planning Council, who's gonna talk about setting the stage in Connecticut. I'll tell you, I've worked with Lori for several years, a very long time, and she is so hardworking and dedicated, and I can't say enough about her in terms of her professionalism and, and compassion and passion for the water world. She's presently the Public Health Branch Chief with the Connect Department of Public Health, Environmental Health, and Drinking Water Branch. She is responsible for state and federal regulatory and technical assistance for the state's 2,500 public water systems, and a variety of environmental health programs. Lori currently ser serves on the Water Planning Council, the state drought interagency team, which she, I'm sure she'll talk about, and is currently, which I'm very excited about and thrilled for the state of Connecticut, is the 2021 president-elect to the Association of State Drinking Water Administrators. This is a nationwide organization of all of her colleagues around the United States that she will be heading up uh, this year. So we congratulate her on that. Thrilled to be with her this morning. And I give you Lori Matthew. Jack, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and as you know, Jack, you and I have worked together for a very long time, and uh, thank you for that. Also, I want to say thank you to the Alliance for Water Efficiency, uh, Marianne, and your colleagues. Um, wonderful to bring this to the state of Connecticut, as Jack mentioned, um, and we're thrilled as a Water Planning Council to be able to bring this to to people in Connecticut. Um, it is an, an incredible, interesting time that we've been through over the last year, and we're so thrilled to be able to do this during this moment in time. Um, so I'm here to, to speak about setting the stage for public water systems in Connecticut, and uh, talking about financing is not my usual business. It's not my usual work. Um, but it is something that impacts our regulatory uh, work and uh, the work that we conduct every day under the Safe Drinking Water Act within the Department of Public Health. So next slide, please. And Laura, you might want to turn on your um, webcam. What's that? You might want to turn on your webcam so people can see you. I do have it on. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm able to see her. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can see myself, so hopefully, okay. Thank you, Marianne. Um, okay, so setting the stage, here's my agenda. I have a few minutes to chat about a number of different things and I want to be able to get through all of it within the time that I have. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, what public water systems in Connecticut, that, as Jack mentioned, the state water plan, which we're very proud of uh, from, from the year 18 as approved through the legislature in 19. We'll talk about what the state water plan says and what it what it was speaking to about water conservation and efficiency. We'll talk a little bit about the drought and I have an interesting graph uh, to share with all of you and a little bit of a interesting look at the last 25 years um, uh, of precipitation. We'll talk about the recent work of our colleagues at DEEP um, working together on climate change and planning um, and some sad information, obviously, about COVID and the impact of COVID. Um, we're all learning that, uh, 
you know, when we still don't know, there's a lot of uncertainty out in, in today's world. So public water systems being prepared and working and implementing planning is so very important to protect drinking water quality and quantity. And really for us in the in DPH um, in, in management of, uh, and management of an oversight of public water systems, regulatory oversight means capacity, managerial, technical, and financial capacity. So next slide, please. So that's my agenda. Just a little bit on Connecticut's uh, public drinking water and, and also on a little bit on private wells. So as Jack mentioned, 2,500 public water systems regulated. The Department of Public Health has primacy of the Safe Drinking Water Act. What does that mean? That means quality um, oversight as well as system inspection, engineers that go out and conduct system inspections and oversight of treatment or any addition or changes to that. And we have oversight of all of the rules that come under the Safe Drinking Water Act, which there are many. Um, about 18 different rules uh, at this point in time and constantly changing and challenging to water systems as well as ourselves as regulators. We also have oversight over for the last hundred years or so, oversight of a whole plethora of statewide um, water supply planning laws, water company owned law, land owned laws, and a number of other state statutes that we also manage and oversee. We regulate quality and quantity. There's 2.9 million people served by public water. There's 500 community systems. 80 of those serve over 1,000 people. 300 of those are very small systems. And within that 300, there's about 200 that serve under 500 people. So we have a lot of small, small community systems. Um, we have 2,000 non-community systems. A non-community system is like a say like a Dunkin' Donuts out in the middle of a rural area that has a well that has its own source. And those are non-community systems that are regulated and inspected by the Department of Public Health. Uh, there's 150 reservoir systems, 4,000, over 4,000 groundwater supplies, low yielding groundwater supplies, most of those are. And there are over 350,000 private wells that serve over 800,000 people in our state. So next slide, please. I'm not going to explain all the details here, but you see in blue, that's the where the service area uh, for our for our community public water systems is in the state of Connecticut. The other the dots are the wells. You can see the wells are um, located in the more rural parts of our state, um, and the watershed areas are in that uh, lighter color. Those about 17% of our state are drainage areas to our 150 reservoir system. So next slide, please. So you can see it's quite a busy map there with a lot of um, sources and a variety of, of different uh, challenges that come along with every town in the protection of the drinking water quality and supply and supply and quality. So what does a state water plan say? Um, if a lot of you on this, and there are 78 of you right now, um, many of you uh, participated in pulling together uh, the plan itself um, and developing the plan. The Water Planning Council was responsible, but we couldn't have done it without all of the help um, of the stakeholders that were involved for years and years before that to get the law passed and to get the funding in place and to get the structure in place. So we are very proud of our plan, uh, the first of its kind for the state of Connecticut ever. It was approved by the legislature in 2019 and Governor Malloy said, you, ne you now need to start implementation. Uh, one of the most basic things, and it was a discussion point for many years when pulling the plan together, was we don't have a water conservation ethic in our state. We lost it. We had it in the 80s because of the 80-81 drought, if anyone remembers that. Um, but the plan says we need to build the ethic. We need to maintain, the plan also says, to maintain the highest quality water for drinking purposes, for human consumption, and make sure that that water is there. Raw water quality is important to keeping the prices low uh, for human consumption so that treatment systems um, and the price of treatment systems um, are not out of control. So keeping those raw water quality uh, at the highest level for human consumption is an important issue, but also balancing is an important aspect, balancing for all uses so that um, you have water for everyone in all uses. Um, and to what another thing that was really very important for this plan, this plan isn't uh, the absolute roadmap about what to do and how to do it. 
It identified policy recommendation and implementation items and provided guiding principles to inform our decisions. And I would like to thank, if you can go to the next slide, I would like to thank today, the plan is guiding us. The plan is guiding us into what we need to start to do for water conservation and water efficiency. So again, the plan did say, and it says this, <laughs> we lag in the water conservation ethic. It spoke to the need for possible legislation uh, for conservation laws and in incentives. It spoke about education and outreach as a strategy, which was very critical and important. Um, to review what we have and identify areas for improvement and that the Water Planning Council itself shall adopt or should adopt policies on conservation incentives. And so there's a number of other items here, um, exploring incentives for outdoor water conservation measures, supporting smart water uh, model ordinances for lo uh, local municipal governments or local health departments, working with the green in industry on buildings. So there's a lot to do. There was a lot pointed out within the state water plant and, and obviously strengthening partnerships. Uh, so why I summarize this, I, I think just teeing this up and setting the stage for what the state water plan, as a reminder, what the state water plan says and speaks to on water conservation and water efficiency. So next slide, please. So an interesting slide as promised um, about drought. So I know you can't read the whole thing, but this is a 25 year period, a monthly standardized precipitation index from 1995, which starts over um, on, the, on the left hand side over to today's, um, uh, today's year uh, on, the, on the right hand side. So this shows precipitation um, since 1995 and the red and yellow colors um, are when we're in a drought situation and the blue shows the precipitation and, and that we're not in a drought period. But as you can tell, um, if you go toward the end of this chart, you see the last 10 years, it's an interesting pattern when you started start to look at this uh, in this way, you start to recognize that maybe we've been in a, in a longer sustained drought for a lot longer period than we have actually thought. So this to me, and the drought of 16 into 17, and then the drought that we experienced last summer was quite interesting to us. What is actually happening with our climate? Uh, what do we need to do better? Has the 2020 drought actually ended or is it continuing? Will we have another sustained period of dry conditions? Right now, we're seeing dry conditions. Will that, will that continue? We need to be more prepared with our planning. Climate change certainly is here and we need to recognize the impact. So next slide, please. We need to recognize the impact of climate change on our drinking water supplies. And there was a lot of discussion under Governor Lamont's climate change executive order number three under Commissioner Katie Dykes as her lead uh, into setting up many work groups and a plan was developed. There's a lot out there. You can go check out the plan and the details of the plan. But I was co-chair of last year on the public health and safety work group. Also um, participated in the infrastructure work group as many of you did. And there was a, recogni a recognition of climate change impact on, on our state's drinking water supplies. And not only public, but also private wells as well, as I mentioned. There's, there's uh, well over 300,000 private wells, um, which aren't tested quality nor quantity. So there is a recognition in the governor's plan about impact of climate change. Um, there's a recognition that there needs to be a priority focus on the protection of the quality and quantity of drinking water supplies. We need to work harder to understand the impact of climate change on our safe daily yields and our raw water quality. We need to make, make sure that we uh, assure sustainable drinking water supplies and systems moving into the future. So next slide. So there was a lot of work done and, and I, applied, I applaud Deep uh, for all of the work that has been done last year. Now, I, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but I thought that I would, you can't, I can't go anywhere and give a presentation without <laughs> recognizing what we have been through in the last year. And this is just a snapshot of what we've all been through in the state of Connecticut. Unfortunately, the total, this is a little out of date, the total deaths as of this morning 
was just about 7,800. Um, who knew a year for, a year ago that we would have gone through the last year in the way that we did? The total cases are approaching 300,000 total cases in the state of Connecticut. This has impacted us and how we do our work in the Department of Public Health tremendously, and it has impacted the water industry. Um, and you know the, the the big picture of COVID is yet to move forward. Is yet to move forward. We're not out of this. As you see that you know the deaths and the spikes of over the over a year's time, we're plateauing unfortunately, and we hope that they continue to go down, but the variants are still out there. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So next slide. There's a lot of uncertainty about the lasting impact of COVID and the lessons learned. We need to learn lessons from what we've been through in the last year. One of the lessons is when I was thinking about what to say and how to wrap up this presentation is that we need to be prepared all the time. It's an ongoing planning and implementation effort. It is not just write a plan and give it to the state of Connecticut and let them review and approve it. Utilities, State agencies need to be prepared for all emergencies to address the uncertainty that we all have to face all risks, including um, a national and international pandemic. We need to work with our state water plan. We need to implement it. We need to continue to work, and we have been working with our drought plan because we have to, as well as the Water Utility Coordinating Committee plans. It is important to start to implement planning and to understand the impact of quality and quantity and not to forget about the customers and the messaging to customers and communication and education for them is very important. We need to continue the AWEA law, the American Water Infrastructure Act of 2018, which has sort of been forgotten about a little bit, but there's a requirement in there to update and prepare risk assessments and emergency response plans on a continuous basis. That needs to be taken very seriously. And those need to be updated moving forward under federal law, under the Safe Drinking Water Act. We need to address financial, managerial, and technical capacity of all of our systems, which is a lot to do because we have many. Next slide, please. So I think this is my last slide. So preparedness planning needs to be inclusive of all stakeholders involving regional and local officials and customers. And I think that's part of where sometimes we forget about um, the impact and the inclusion of our local elected officials, um, our legislators, who I'm glad to see on the panel uh, tomorrow because they need to be involved in what we're talking about and what we're thinking about. So do local health officials. It needs to be inclusive of health equity. If you remember at the tail end of, of producing the state water plan, we spoke about health equity a little bit because Commissioner Pino, who was a commissioner of DPH at the time, wanted that concept in the state water plan. We need to understand health equity more and how that impacts the customers. Um, we need to acknowledge water quantity and understand it and plan better in our planning. We need to understand the impacts of climate change on raw water quality and what does that mean to us. Well, and then <laughs> my favorite item is emerging contaminants. To me, it's challenging to even say these words. PFAS, Legionella, disinfection byproducts, manganese, et cetera, et cetera. Those of you in the water business, the UCMR5, testing over 20 additional PFAS. What are they going to find? What are, what's the uncertainty of what's going to be found? What, what will customers think? How do we prepare for all of these contaminants, these emerging contaminants that are coming our way and will change the way we do business for the next 10 years? We also must address the impact of climate change and extreme weather events. So these last three bullets. The role of water conservation must limit the waste and assure that our high, drink, high quality drinking water is held for human consumption. And it needs to be protective of public health. If we've learned nothing from COVID-19, the fundamental business that we're in of supplying water to people 
is so very important. If you all remember the questions that we received in, in March, is the water safe to drink? Can COVID live and survive within our drinking water supplies? Remember those questions? People were scared. Let's never forget that because there is so much uncertainty out there in this world today. The impact of these new laws that are coming our way by the federal government will impact system capacity and system sustainability across our state. So for, for us, and, and work with Jack constantly on this, to provide professional oversight and ownership models to address management, technical, and financial capacity of all of our systems, mostly the small systems that we work with that struggle, um, and the larger systems that will struggle with these new laws and how to implement them as they try to balance their water quality and quantity, and they face the next 10 years looking at and trying to manage all of this uncertainty. So next slide, please. So with that, I say thank you. Thank you for allowing me to say a few words and um, you know, to set the stage. Unfortunately, it's not a rosy picture. Um, there's my contact email if you have any um, other questions for me, but I, I unfortunately can't stay through this whole thing, but I'll come back later for the uh, Q&A. Um, and again, it's a pleasure to serve with Jack on the Water Planning Council, as well as Martin Heft and Graham Stevens. Um, and thank you so much uh, for your time and thank you for being on this webinar. Jack? Thank you very, thank you very much, Lori. Lori, I'm very impressed with you today. You were early for this and you uh, went, you're ahead of schedule. So uh, thank you very much for your of really, course. Yeah. really of course. great remarks and, and very appropriate remarks. And uh, I'm gonna provide with, with some information that we can certainly thank talk you. about later. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. So next this morning, we're going to hear from Marianne Dickinson, who is with the Executive Director of the Alliance for Water Efficiency. And she's going to talk about strategies for aligning rates, revenues, and resources. And again, I have to thank Marianne and her team for really helping us put this conference together and, and uh, it's shaping up to be a great uh, couple of days. Marianne is the president and CEO of the Alliance for Water Efficiency, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting the efficient and sustainable use of water in the United States and Canada. Headquartered in Chicago, it works with over 520 water utilities, water conservation professionals in business and industry, planners, regulators, and consumers. Marianne has over 50 years of experience having worked at the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, the Southern South Center Connecticut Regional Water Authority, and the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. A graduate at the University of Connecticut with a degree in environmental planning, Marianne has authored numerous publications on water conservation, land use planning, and natural resources management. Good morning, Marianne. Happy to have you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Jack, and thank you very much, Lori, for your excellent presentation. It helped us set the stage for what we're going to talk about in this workshop. So I would be remiss if I didn't just start out by thanking uh, the co-hosts who made their mailing lists available and let you all know that we were holding this workshop. Uh, in addition to the State of Connecticut Water Planning Council agencies, DEEP, OPM, DPH, and Pura, we had the assistance of the Connecticut Water Works Association, the Connecticut Section American Water Works Association, the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, Connecticut Council of Small Towns, and the Rivers Alliance of Connecticut. Uh, so we thank all of you for helping us with this workshop and helping get the word out. But I would also be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the Connecticut Water Company because it was their financial support that made this whole project possible. So just to quickly go over what we're going to do in this workshop uh, today, in addition to hearing uh, Lori's talk about setting the stage in Connecticut, I'm going to talk a little bit about a general overview of rates, revenue, and resources and why a water efficiency organization is 
involved in this topic. I mean, it doesn't make sense to most people. Why are you involved in rates? And so I will explain that. Then we'll take a, a quick little break. And then uh, Bill Christensen of our staff will demonstrate our rate model. Um, and that will be how we'll finish off the day. We'll have uh, plenty of time for questions and answers. As Jack mentioned, <clears throat> we're running a little ahead of schedule. So we'll have lots of time for questions at the end of the morning. Um, tomorrow we will have a jam-packed day. You'll see we don't even have time for a break tomorrow, but I think you'll really enjoy what we've put together. We're going to have, uh, again, I'll just do some quick logistics. Uh, Jack will do some welcoming remarks to start off. And then uh, Jan Beecher, Dr. Beecher from the uh, University of Michigan Institute of Public Utilities, will talk about methods for addressing conservation-related revenue attrition, a very, very important topic for this workshop. Um, Maureen Westbrook from Connecticut Water will talk about driving conservation programs with support of rate making tools. Um, and we will also have a panel uh, discussion that will occur. Um, and then we will have a rate model case study where we'll talk about uh, regional water authorities being willing to be a volunteer for our rate model case study. We'll have questions and answers, and then we will again adjourn. If you registered for this workshop, um, I think all of you should have by now received materials that accompany this workshop that were sent out from the Alliance for Water Efficiency. If you didn't get them, they may be located in your spam folder. Uh, so take a look. Uh, I think the name under which it was coming would be Jeffrey Hughes. But we have posted all of these materials online. I will also um, show you where those are. Uh, but in addition to uh, some fact sheets you'll see number six is a rates handbook i will talk a little bit more about that in my presentation but that's the biggest piece of what we've sent you we sent you a free copy of it in pdf uh, but we also find that people really prefer to have it as a hard copy especially if you're um you know a, a, a board of director on a water utility board or a local official in a city council or first selectman that has to approve rates. This is a book that's written for you. It is not a detailed rate manual written for a rate setter. It's really written for people who every day worry about uh, local rates and, and how to properly uh, assess what they should be. So that rates handbook is something I wanted to just point out to everyone, make sure you, you took a look at it. Uh, and then you can order it in, in hard copy form if you wish, uh, as well as some membership information if you're interested in being part of the Alliance for Water Efficiency. Uh, I mentioned though that we have posted it online. We have a website which we'll, we'll talk about today called Financing Sustainable Water. And in the implementation tab of that website, um, it is, it's got a whole page on the Connecticut Rates Workshop with all of those uh, handouts you'll see have already been posted. We will also, after this workshop, post the recordings of the workshop and post the PDFs of the presentations that you will be seeing. So that will be a good go-to page. We'll have that live for a very long time. So if you are not able to see all of the workshop at, at once live, you can always go back and look at the recording later. So here's the, the website that I just mentioned. And it, the implementation tab here is where you click, and then you will see when you click on it, that it'll be the Connecticut uh, 2021 rates workshop. Okay, so what I'd like to sort of dive into is um, just how hard it is for the utilities now to deal with financial management. It's it's harder than ever these days. And uh, this is a this is an old chart, but I still like it because it, it shows the downward trend of water sales. This is residential water sales in a, a national group of uh, private water companies. And it shows that we had, you know, nice booming growth in water sales in the 80s. And then it just really began to decline. And it's really declined since uh, even since 2010, which is the end of the time period of this chart, it's declined even further. Um, residential per capita can sometimes be declined. In, in some utility systems as much as 1% per year, just purely based on you know, new fixtures being installed in homes that are much more efficient than the prior fixtures had been. So yes, isn't that a success story? Isn't it a good idea that, that 
the highest per capita water using um, continent in the world uh, is now reducing its per capita to what Australia and Europe and, and other developed countries are using. But yes, it's true, but it does have side effects. And it's the side effects we're going to talk about today. Um, when you lower your demand, you reduce your sales revenue unless you make adjustments. And that reduced sales revenue can mean, depending upon how your rate structure is set up, that you're not fully collecting your fixed costs. Um, and those fixed costs are your short-run variable costs that are related to the delivery of water, pumping, uh, energy, chemicals, uh, but also the long-run capacity costs, you know, costs of supply, uh, transmission, storage, uh, and particularly treatment. Um, so one of the concerns that we hear from our water utility members, and, and many of our members are water utilities, about two thirds of our membership are, are we work with water utilities. Revenue stability is a big issue for them. And they're, they're very nervous about how much conservation they can do if, uh, if it's gonna affect their revenues if they don't adjust uh, how they collect their revenues. And so conservation becomes a scapegoat. It's often blamed um, when customers uh, need to have their um, rates rise be to cover the, the, the fixed costs that haven't been covered with the declining demand. It's, conservation is blamed, and the customer gets confused. It's a, it's a mixed message for the customer. Well, you asked me to conserve when we had a drought, so why are you punishing me with a rate increase? So uh, it's, it's, and it's more than just the customer unhappiness and the, the, the rate changes that need to happen. If you don't address your revenue stability and you have long-term unstable revenue collection, that can affect uh, bond ratings. And uh, here's a, a, an article from the Texas Tribune in Texas where um, the city of Fort Worth had their bond rating downgraded. Um, the Fitch agency downgraded their water and sewer debt and the firm um, ended up losing, and this is in red, $11 million last year because of water conservation. And the irony is Fort Worth doesn't really have a very aggressive water conservation program. It's really because they didn't plan that revenue decline that was happening automatically in the background that we've been talking about. And um, so you have to pay attention to this because this has uh, financial effects in a wide variety of ways. And, and uh, Dr. Beecher will talk a lot about that tomorrow. Um, so what are the, the factors that go into revenue stability and why did we care at the Alliance for Water Efficiency to deal with that? Um, yes, it comes, reduced water sales come from reduced demand. Uh, some of it comes from efficient fixture replacement that the customers are doing as they remodel their bathrooms and kitchens. And so the plumbing and appliance codes and, and new standards passed at the federal level are making all of those fixtures and appliances a lot more efficient. So it does tend to reduce customer water use. And then of course there are utilities that have very active conservation programs and that tends to reduce uh, the demand. But then, you know, when there's a recession, um, the pandemic is an example of it in some cases, if you have a system that has a lot of commercial and, and industrial use and you've got um, you know, reduced shifts, um, home foreclosures, or you know, a lot of uh, downtown office buildings that are now empty. Um, city of San Francisco as an example, city of Chicago where I'm sitting right now, you know, the vacancy rate is very high in the downtown office building, so the water use is also down. Um, another factor is reduced peak demand in wet years. If you're pricing your water so that your, your inclining block rate structure uh, gives you more money for those high irrigation tiers, then when it rains a lot, there's a reduced peak in the demand. And the reduced peak is a good thing for your system, but it, it does wreak havoc with your revenues and it's something you need to look at. Um, there's increased infrastructure costs, lots of repair and replacement costs that have nothing to do with conservation. They have to do with system maintenance, but it costs money. Uh, there's a rise in other fixed costs and inflation when inflation occurs. <laughs> Not exactly now, but uh, those are factors long term that can, can affect uh, how revenue stability works. And here's a chart that I've stolen from uh, Dr. Beecher. She's going to talk about it more tomorrow, but, but this basically shows the rate index compared to the consumer price index. Consumer price index is in the gray line and the water and sewer line is the blue line that's sort of skating out of sight on the right hand side of the graph. So uh, water and garbage are the two uh, ones that are really uh, spiking uh, 
hard in this graph. And uh, as I say, Dr. Beecher will talk about it tomorrow, but I wanted to just sort of give a, a shout out to it right now. There's also a phenomenon where the electric bill and the water bill are beginning to compete with each other in terms of what is, is higher. And this is an interesting analysis done by uh, USA Today, but uh, basically what it shows is that uh, in, in towns like um, Santa Fe, for example, the, the electric bill and the water bill are really pretty much the same size. But in a lot of cities, including New York and Chicago, uh, places where you wouldn't expect it very soon, the electric and water bills will be uh, comparably sized. And that's something we, we never saw before. Water bill was always much cheaper than the energy bill. So what's what's the impact of this? And can we make water efficiency cost effective. Uh, we at the Alliance for Water Efficiency got a little panicked when so many utilities were canceling conservation programs because their chief financial officer said, we can't afford to do conservation. It, 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 we lose too much revenue. So we knew we needed to get involved to do something that would help this cycle. And um, so we started to hold summits and meetings with um, uh, general managers with uh, rate setting experts uh, and to develop materials like the rates handbook that you'll see in a minute um, to sort of get at this cycle of how we set our rates and how we can set rates that would be water efficient. So this is sort of a flow diagram that shows you have costs of a system, which of course then lead to how you would set your water rates. And then that how you set your water rates leads to what your demand en ends up being, whether your demand is responsive to the way your water rates have been structured. And then that demand, uh, as it goes up or down, leads to how you design your system, which then, of course, influences the costs uh, of that system, which then feed back into rates. It's a dynamic process. It's not a one and done rate setting is not a one and done uh, phenomenon. So we know that there's lots of flux here and that it's very difficult for water utilities to do that kind of planning. But what we want to emphasize is that conservation is part of the solution and can be part of the solution and still uh, can, you know, not impair revenue stability. Um, we've done a fair amount of work at the Alliance for Water Efficiency to document what the long-term a reduction in cost is to the utility when they do conservation programs. This is particularly true for utilities that are growing. Um, and we often find that the revenue loss uh, can be due to other drivers like, you know, big infrastructure repairs, um, you know, where the, the, the revenue collected is not then equal to the, the costs that are are needed to be paid. Um, and revenue loss can be due to other things like the economy or changes in um, in demand, uh, as an example, um, the, uh, I'll show you a little bit later when we get to the messaging section that the, the uh, Louisville Journal Courier did an article about the city of Louisville saying that you know they they had to spike their their rates because of conservation. And then you when you read the article uh, and you get to column eight, you discover well, they lost their largest industrial customer. It was a huge drop in their uh, industrial revenue. And so though there are lots of reasons why uh, revenue loss occurs and you just have to inventory what those are. Uh, but when you think about conservation, uh, every gallon that you save is a gallon of water that doesn't have to be pumped, treated and delivered. Uh, and then transported back uh, for wastewater treatment. So there are savings, variable cost savings that are applied there. Um, conservation is an investment. You invest in conservation the way you invest in al alternative water supplies, but you have to plan for the short-term effects of, of that conservation investment and that reduction in demand. And that's really what we wanted to, to stress in this workshop and why the speakers will be focusing on this and how you do that. Um, reduced utility costs that come from conservation uh, generally can mean reduced customer rates in the long term because you are avoiding infrastructure capacity increases if you don't have to build to a, a, a higher demand level. Here's a chart that illustrates this principle. It's from the American Water Works Association M52 Water Conservation Manual. And what it basically shows is, uh, if, if this is a stylized diagram, it's not in, intending to be representative of a specific utility system, but it's basically trying to show that if you have a baseline demand 
line that's going from 2000 to 2040, and that's the, the solid black line. And if your demand is reduced because you do conservation, uh, and that's the dotted line that, that it's reduced to, you can see that your existing capacity constraint, whether it's a drinking water treatment capacity constraint, whether it's a wastewater treatment capacity constraint, whether it's a peak demand uh, supply constraint, whatever that capacity constraint is, it now gives you extra time. You'll see you can delay adding capacity, and then you can downsize that capacity because you won't need as much as you might have if you hadn't had that reduction in demand. And so the area between the, the solid black line and the dotted line is the area of conservation that we focus on. That's cost-effective uh, conservation that we are hoping utilities will still want to do. So when I mentioned that we had done a lot of work taking a look at how conservation can actually help rates stay lower in the long term, this was the first report that we did. We looked at the city of Westminster in Colorado and citizens there were complaining as they do pretty much everywhere, why are we being asked to conserve when the rates are just gonna go up anyway? Why why, why do we bother? Why don't we just use what water we, we need and then we don't have to worry about the, the uh, rate going up and maybe our water bill going up? So the city of Westminster, who had been doing a, a lot of water conservation over the years, probably you know 30 years at least, um, 40 years, uh, Westminster reviewed what their marginal costs for future infrastructure would have been if they hadn't done those conservation programs since 1980. And what they discovered in this analysis and what we published was that since 1980, conservation has saved residents and businesses in the city of Westminster 80% in their tap connection fees and 91% in rates compared to what they would have been without conservation. So that was a very dramatic story, but Westminster is a community that's, that's growing rather quickly. Um, we did another one in Los Angeles, and this was a similar story. Uh, again, very unpopular rate increases, consumers were very unhappy. And so uh, again, we looked at the study we studied what the costs would have been avoided with water conservation programs, what those infrastructure costs might have been. And the LA rate of growth is not as high as, as it was in Westminster, but it's still not zero, of course. Um, and this is the most recent report we did. We completed it um, and we released it in August of 2018. And um, LA had about a $11 billion uh, that they computed that would be, have been avoided infrastructure costs. And that had the net effect of reducing customer bills by uh, nearly 27%. So that's a story that's kind of contrary to what customers assume. They assume that conservation just makes the, their water rates and therefore their bills go up. But that's not what we're finding. The bills uh, actually can go down and we can show the customers that they can go down in this kind of analysis. We also did two other studies in Arizona, two different cities, Tucson and Gilbert in Arizona and had a similar results. But of course, your utility story is going to be different. Every utility story is going to be different uh, because there are different drivers in your system. There are different reasons for why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. And, and uh, Dr. Beecher will go over that tomorrow. Uh, consider the key questions that, um, that will determine the case for water efficiency and utility. Um, and consider where your costs come from and what your future cost risks are. Um, are you buying water from a wholesaler? And are those uh, water costs increasing? We'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow on the panel. Um, are you having costs of capital improvements that are that are increasing and that are, are needing to be uh, paid for? Um, what are your short run variable costs for treatment and energy? What might you save if, if conservation becomes something you take a look at? And most importantly, what's your return on the investment in efficiency? We care at the Alliance for Water Efficiency about cost effective water conservation. We, we don't we would like to help utilities do the right thing, help Connecticut with their conservation ethic, and, and help utilities invest cost effectively in, in water efficiency. But you have to quantify what that is. You have to analyze what that is. So the first step we did back in 2009 was we built what we call our tracking tool, which helps utilities really take a look at their system costs, how their system uh, is growing over time, and how they need to provide for the supply needs uh, in the future. So this tool provides a very forward looking analysis. And here's a screenshot from this tracking tool. Um, the top 
purple line is you know your baseline demand that we had talked about in that other chart the red line is the reduction in demand that comes from you doing nothing it comes from that, those plumbing codes and standards that are in effect for plumbing fixtures and appliances and you need to when you do your your sales forecast you need to take this into consideration because this is happening whether you spend a dollar on conservation or not uh, but if you do invest in a program, then your your blue line, which is that bottom uh, service area demand line, that line can be different depending upon what your investment is. And what this tool helps you figure out is uh, what's cost effective in that reduction and what, what makes sense uh, for your utility in terms of investment. We were always concerned about what the impact was on revenue. And we knew that if, if a utility jumped into water conservation and didn't think about how it was going to be funded and how it was going to adjust for the reduced sales, it was going to get in trouble. So one of the outputs from our tracking tool is the utility revenues and rates worksheet. And it shows what your uh, change in your revenue requirement would be if you did various conservation programs. The red bars uh, represent what it what the changes are, what the positive changes are, the increased uh, amount is in your revenue requirement if you do pay as you go, if you're paying for your conservation out of your operating revenues. Now, you probably wouldn't build any kind of water treatment facility or even drill a well without uh, debt financing it. You wouldn't pay that out of operating revenues on an annual basis. But typically, a lot of utilities do that. And so that helps contribute to that rate shock. If you debt finance uh, your conservation programs, you'll see the green bars show that you're actually saving money on your revenue requirement. It reduces your revenue requirement in the short term. It increases it a little bit more long term, but it's still not the same immediate shock impact when you, you as if you occur when you uh, pay as you go so this was something we wanted to take a look at the whole issue of debt financing is one we've looked at as well so what did the alliance for water efficiency do at that point well we knew we had to come up with a program that we dubbed financing sustainable water and we built a whole website just for this program and what we wanted to do was basically con you know help utilities provide a lot of free tools uh, and information we did get some grant funding from uh, a number of sources from the walton family foundation and from the the um, california water foundation uh, because we it was it was assumed that this kind of information would be useful to utilities uh, provided free of charge to them because what we're saying is that revenue stability is a feature of all rate structures this is not going to be unique to any utility in Connecticut. We're seeing this everywhere. Even, even utilities that are growing rapidly, they don't uh, often have you know, very, very stable revenue structure. So it's something that everybody is experiencing. Efficiency objectives, though, have to be part of that analysis, and they should be identified at the start so that you know how to build that into your uh, rate structure. Uh, one size does not fit all. Everybody's going to be different. Um, you know, we, we've been asked by regulators, what's the best rate structure? And, you know, the, our answer is always the same. It depends. It depends on the utility system needs. It depends on their objectives. It depends on a lot of factors that, that don't, that defy the ability to, to, to specify something right off the bat. But one thing we, we have determined is that there is uncertainty in the way we we design these rates and uh, embracing that uncertainty enables better decision making on rates. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we built the rate model that, that Bill is going to show you later on this morning, uh, because we believe that a better rate analysis uh, will help that decision making. It does require that you have good data to input into the process, uh, but it, it will help you make better decisions and bring to your um, boards of directors and city council members uh, as much much good information as possible to help them with that decision. But your customers are important too, and customer understanding and empowering of them is a key piece of success. Um, helping those customers understand why the rates are changing and, and what that investment means in terms of, of that long-term water supply um, system. And so we, we also uh, wanted to develop the communications tools for the customers, and we'll show you uh, those later as well. So uh, lastly, sound financial policies can support fiscal sustainability, and uh, the rates handbook does have quite a bit there. 
So here's the kind of materials that are on the Financing Sustainable Water website. Uh, we have the Rates Handbook, which is uh, interesting enough, called the same thing, Building Better Rates in an Uncertain World, the same as our workshop today. And it's a handbook that explains in layperson's terms, it's a very easy to read document, key concepts, case studies, and uh, implementation advice uh, for communities. Um, we also, uh, you can download uh, our sales forecasting and rate model. And um, we, we didn't, we didn't um, provide that directly in the email to the attendees because we want to keep track of who has the rate model. As we make changes to the rate model, we will send you an updated version. So we need to know who is using it. Um, and so that rate model, which Bill will demonstrate, is uh, again, a, a user-friendly tool. You don't have to be a rate analyst to, to use it, but it'll help you model scenarios, uh, solve for flaws, incorporate uncertainty into your rate making. And it's, it's cool the way it does that. Bill will show you that. Uh, and all that is put together uh, with a, a number of other resources in terms of communications resources. Uh, it's all put together on this financingsustainablewater.org uh, website. So um, just to talk a little bit about one of the, the, the principles that are in the handbook, um, the heart of the problem is that we have traditionally focused water rates solely on historical cost recovery and system costs when they change quickly and sometimes perhaps unpredictably, COVID is a good uh, predictor of that, uh, historical rates don't reflect today's cost consequences and so they need to be adjusted. And the rates, if they're not adjusted, they don't then give customers the correct information for them to make consumptive decisions as well. So it's it's all part of uh, one one big piece. And the handbook spends a fair amount of time talking about that. It's, it's attachment number six in the handouts we sent you. And it has uh, various sections that, um, that deal with these issues, including some detailed appendices on uh, costing methods, demand and revenue modeling, and uh, the user guide for um, the rate model, which is a separate download. Uh, but it basically gives you lots of advice on how to develop and implement an efficiency-oriented rate structure. Because what we wanted to make sure we did is in, in, in helping utilities through the, the, the rate issues, we wanted to make sure conservation was not forgotten, that conservation is not is not incompatible with a revenue stable rate structure, but it has to be built uh, with that in mind. And so that was one of the reasons we, we put together this rate handbook to make that, that, um, that point. Um, it gives you a great introduction to rate setting. It gives you lots of different ways uh, to, to set up your rates from water budget based rates, um, you know, to uh, uniform block or inclining block rates, uh, seasonal consumption charges. All of these are discussed in the, the rates manual. Value of service pricing is discussed, policy based rates and drought pricing in particular. Um, and steps, we go through the steps in the handbook of how you build an efficiency oriented rate structure, how you prioritize your rate making objectives and determine what your revenue requirement is because you have to meet your revenue requirement. And that's important to every utility CFO. Uh, but how you allocate those costs and what how the rate structure should be designed uh, and then evaluate it against the objectives that you set at the outset of the process. So the, the handbook goes through a lot of that. Um, but a lot of the answers that you need are analytical answers. Um, answers to questions like how can weather, drought, or other kinds of shortage, or even some kind of external shock affect customer consumption. Um, if, if you change your rates, what happens to your demand, volume, and revenue? Um, in, in a drought, how should you plan for water rates under the contingency of, of a non-zero drought shortage occurrence? Or what if there's a high probability of that? How should you plan for your water rates in that? And then what's the probability that you're actually going to collect the revenue that you've projected? What's the likelihood that you might actually have a deficit? Uh, there's, there's probability analysis that happens there. And we didn't see any rate models that actually did any kind of simulation. So that was something we wanted to, to 
build. We wanted to deal with the probabilities in, in a direct way. Um, and then overall fiscal sustainability. What, what's the likelihood that you will be fiscally sustainable over a five-year time horizon? And most importantly, can your customers afford the water service that are now being priced? So these are all analytical questions. We knew we needed to build a rate model to do that. And that's what Bill will be uh, demonstrating uh, a little bit later this morning. And it, it will gives you all of those things. It'll demand a model water demand variability. It'll model your revenue. Uh, variability. It'll give you an analysis of the customer bills for a specific rate structure design and how that breaks out. It'll assess the affordability. It'll assess your overall fiscal sustainability. Um, and and I just want to point out that this model is free. You can, uh, if you have a rate consultant that works with you, you the rate consultant is welcome to use that as well. We're, we're, we're happy to make this uh, freely available. Um, here's just a, a quick snapshot of the affordability of water service uh, charts, and, and Bill will go through that. Um, but I wanted to just let you know that these are the kinds of things that are in this model. It's, it's an example of what we wanted to produce in this program to, to help water utilities uh, navigate through this, this process. Um, and we wanted to make sure that you also had diagrams that you could show the, your, your in board presentations, uh, that you were able to adequately present the issues for, for their decision making. Um, and drought pricing, you know, as Laurie showed you, there's there's a good potential that you know Connecticut could have uh, again another drought this season um, in 2021. Uh, so in, in many respects, drought, although you don't have it as much in the East Coast as they have it in the West Coast, shortages are still an issue. And uh, the question is when, not if. Uh, so planning for them is a really important uh, phenomenon. And um, and, and recognizing that as you imp implement drought pricing and impose a curtailment on the customer, that affects your revenues and that you need to figure out what that is um, basically going to produce. Um, drought rates that maintain revenue neutrality through the drought stages can be planned for, communicated and implemented and uh, the rate model and Bill will show you how that, that's done. The last thing I wanted to just mention is one of the financing sustainable water revenue uh, sustainable water resources is a document that we put together on managing weather risk. And um, this was something that um, we were approached by a derivatives manager who said, why aren't derivatives in, in use in the water industry? They have wide swings in costs and revenues. Why, why aren't derivatives being used to offset that? And um, we didn't know the answer to it, so we, we basically explored it um, and took a look at what was available on, from, with a market-based financial tool for managing weather risk. And insurance was one that really jumped out, much more so than derivatives, uh, because you know municipal snow removal insurance is a perfect example. I mean, every every uh, New England community's got snow insurance, right? Because you don't know if you're going to have a huge snow year where you use a lot of overtime and have a lot of extra salt costs. Um, and there are the years where you don't get a lot of snow. And so there's an insurance policy that covers that wide fluctuation. And we thought, well, you know, maybe there's a reason to do that with, with demand if it's fluctuating so rapidly with water shortages and drought. Maybe that's something that, that the utility can be compensated for uh, in, in those off years. So um, this is just an exploratory paper, but um, I think there's interest in the market. We have heard there's interest in the market for not only insurance, but also derivatives and helping utilities for that. So if you wanted to take a look at that, that's also on the Financing Sustainable water uh, web page. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about debt financing conservation and this is a policy issue. Um, most utilities don't debt finance conservation and it was something we explored early on. We couldn't figure out why and then we discovered it was because the Government Accounting Standards Board, GASB, their rules um, basically require assignment of an asset to the debt and of course when you have conserved water that's not really an asset. The conservation is not owned by the water utility. It's usually on the customer's side of the meter. So uh, there's nothing to offset the debt on the balance sheet. 
And so without control of the asset, as, as Gasby is defining it, a utility CFO usually doesn't want to debt finance something and have a, a liability without an asset, corresponding asset on the balance sheet. So we were finding that it was, it was this sort of accounting rulemaking that was keeping people from considering uh, debt financing of conservation programs. And so the solution has been explored. Uh, GASB has been, uh, there's been a fair amount of time, but it's been spent with the Government Accounting Standards Board. And they will now allow debt financing of conservation as a regulatory asset, particularly if, um, it, you know, the, the conservation is being mandated by a regulator. But even if it isn't, it can be considered part of a, of a rate case, which is a, considered a regulatory asset. So now there are ways to, to debt finance uh, conservation and to avoid that that early quick revenue shock. Um, and it, it got me to thinking about this because when I worked for South Central Connecticut Regional Water Authority <laughs> back in 1989, um, we did as a result of that 80s drought that, that Laurie mentioned, we did a conservation program and we worked with lots of water utilities throughout the state, but we debt financed that conservation investment. I mean, it was a half a million dollars and regional water debt financed it. And I always thought that's what everybody would do and discover uh, that debt financing was on the decline because of these GASB rules. So I think now the door is open to that changing. Um, again, here's another uh, chart of the same sort of impact uh, showing, you know, the, the immediate uh, the impacts of debt financing, the positive impacts of debt financing, those green bars, versus the, uh, the early rate shock of uh, the annual revenue requirement when you pay as you go in a conservation program and experience the reduced sales at the same time. So you have to make those adjustments and debt financing tends to smooth that out. So I just want to finish up by talking about uh, the communications part of it. You know, how do we communicate change uh, in these rates uh, to the customers? And the political reality is not a fun one. You know, we, we don't like to revise our rates. It's painful. Um, I was a um, water utility um, board of directors member uh, having to approve a very steep uh, rate increase for our customers. And um, I, I was routinely back in the days of the answering machine coming home to 70 messages on my machine with angry customers. It's hard to, it, it's really hard to revise rates and have the customers understand what's happening. And because it's politically unpopular, um, you know, general managers tend to want to defer the pain as, as, long as possible. And so we, we tend to not do annual rate adjustments, but we do them in, in chunks um, so that the change and the pain of the change occurs as little as possible. But it, it that means you're postponing it until it's some kind of crisis. Uh, and that's also not a good situation. Once you start getting into double digit uh, rate increases, then there's no way the customer is going to understand why that is, even if it's been eight years since they had any kind of adjustment. And again, conservation is blamed for the financial challenges uh, facing a utility, even when there aren't any conservation programs in place. I mentioned the Louisville Journal Courier. Here's the um, here's the Sunday paper headline: Conservation driving up water rates, environmental concerns challenge bottom line at Louisville Water Company. And it's not until you get to the as I say, column eight, that you find out, well, they lost their big industrial customer. So I called the reporter and I said, why didn't you say that? And he said, oh, I don't do the headlines. That's my editor. And he thought it would sell more papers. So it fans the flames and the media loves to say, well, you know, it's it's a double digit rate increase, even if the overall bill is maybe going up by four dollars a month. So these are these are communications issues that we have. Um, and, you know, we, we need to make uh, our local media partners in this messaging rather than um, fanning the flames of, of a perceived consumer rebellion. Um, so this is this is part of what we wanted to also provide in financing sustainable water to help um, utility managers deal with this. And communicating the value of water has been a problem for a long time. Uh, you know, customers take that water for granted. They don't realize what goes into the provision of safe, affordable drinking water. They are, they, they really, until like in Texas this past month, you know, until they have no water coming out of the tap, they don't appreciate just how 
how great an investment that is in their community. So one of the things we did was we created a set of videos. Um, we created customer videos. The first one is called Water What You Pay For, and it explains what water services and cost. Um, it, it talks about what the, the pipes, plants, power, and people that, that keep your water flowing, and, um, and, and basically shows the consumer from the point of uh, immediate, um, you know, it, you know the the input into the system. Uh, it, there's a little water meter in the corner that shows how the cost increases as it goes through the system and how it comes back out. <clears throat> and it's set to the average residential customer water bill. We can adjust that if you if you would like to customize the video for yourself. But it's a three minute video. It's an animated uh, video, and it's free for utilities to use. We also have one that explains uh, why your water uh, rates are going up, what that means, what the investment means, uh, explaining that conservation helps keep rates down in the long term, but you need to make the investment now. And so these are two videos, they're both about three minutes each that, that you can freely use. You can post them on your own website. You, they're, these are not videos that um, you, you can, you don't have to send them to our website for it. You can actually post the videos on your own. But the kinds of messages that it gives are messages like every gallon saved is a gallon that doesn't have to be pumped, treated, or delivered. And those savings are reflected in your water bill. Cons conservation helps slow down the rise of water rates over the long term. So here's the water what you pay for video. You'll see that um, meter in the corner. And with that sort of goes up to whatever the average customer water bill. This is the end of the, close to the end of the the presentation so you know you, you'll see that number that, that goes up as it's going through the system um, and these are the utility employees and we discuss how they provide uh, safe drinking water in the system and then the second video why are my water rates going up is another um, video that again talks about what customers are needing to understand about these these costs being an investment in the system and that their their water bill their rate may be going up but the water bill may actually stay relatively stable if they're a conserving household a conserving household will always pay less than a household that doesn't and that's another uh, part of the message um, so the handbook also goes into the public engagement process uh, and how you set up uh, a dialogue with um, your community, um, maybe setting up an advisory committee of you know, local citizens that are very involved in the community uh, that can help in integrated and collaborative planning on a, on a rate structure change. Because that if it's a community decision and it's one where the more people that are invested, the, 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 more, the better chance you have of getting it uh, bought in not only from the leadership but from the uh, citizenry at large and so getting to yes is something we're going to talk about on our panel um, we know elected officials have a tough spot um, I was at tie-breaking vote when I, on my water board and so people directed all their anger at me and I didn't have um, desires for future political office so it didn't b bother me when I didn't get reelected but there are some water board commissioners and water directors and city councilors who, who don't want to impact their electability by approving of a, a rate increase. And so we, we need to talk to them and we need to talk to them about uh, the investment in the community. Um, we also need to help with the internal communications and customer service. Our customer service representatives are at the end of the phone with the customers. And so there's tips in the handbook about messaging with them. And then just, just sort of strategies for treating the public as partners um, and giving them clear signals empowering them as uh, customers in the system and um, and just sort of maintaining uh, an ongoing conversation and dialogue and, and making sure that your message is matching what it, the objectives are for the system that you want to achieve and so what we have on the financing sustainable water web page is a water rates message plan and we have uh, messages that you can use you can pull from them and uh, tailor them as you as you wish and um, the messages basically cover these these uh, five areas 
uh, what the service and value are that water utilities provide to the community and what the benefits and value of uh, water efficiency investments are, um, why there's a need for a rate revision or a new rate structure at this moment in time, and what the relationship is between conservation and rates and making sure people aren't, again, blaming conservation for everything that's related to that rate change. And then what the impact of drivers are, such as drought or water quality, and um, especially, you know, as, as Laurie was talking about the emerging contaminants, you know, water quality is becoming increasingly more expensive for these systems and that's that safety has a cost to it and that's something the customer has to understand but but it's all customizable to, to tell your story at your water utility so those messages are all posted on the financing sustainable water web page and here's the um, the website, this is what it looks like. Um, you'll see the tabs at the top and the implementation tab. When you click on that, we'll have all of the uh, Connecticut Rates Workshop information. But you'll see there's uh, lots of information uh, down below. Uh, water managers have their own section. Elected officials have a section. Concerned citizens have a section. And media has a section. And you can download the rate model. It's there on the, on the right-hand side in the, in the rates handbook. You already will have the rates handbook, but you should go ahead and download the the rate model, all of it is free. So at this point, I will um, turn it back over to Jack. I think we we might have time for a, a break here. Thank you very much, Marianne. Great presentation. And yes, we do. And we're going to take a break at this point. It's uh, ten fourteen. So let's take a break to ten thirty, and then we will come back with uh, Bill Christensen. So. Enjoy your break. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone back to the webinar. The next speaker we're going to have this morning is Bill Christensen. Bill is the Director of Programs at the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and he's going to speak on the effective rate modeling in an uncertain world. He's been with the Alliance for Water Efficiency since 2007. His work includes research related to the many aspects of water resource management, such as policy analysis, water conservation program planning and evaluation, benefit cost analysis, drought planning, and water rate evaluation. He has worked with water utilities throughout the United States and Canada and has traveled to the countries of China and Jordan on work related projects. Bill, welcome. I think, Bill, you might be muted. There you go. We still can't hear you. Hmm. Let's try that. Can you hear me? There we go. Perfect. It's all yours, Bill. And let's try it one more time because I just got another notification. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can hear you. All right. Yeah, sorry, we tested that out. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Christensen. And what I was saying when I was muted is that I'm going to walk you through the AWE rate model, uh, focus on its simulation feature, and really get into the importance of considering uncertainty and planning, and specifically around rate design. So, I'm going to turn off my webcam while going through the slides. Uh, and, uh, Marianne, if you could bring up uh, the slides, that would be great. So Marianne kind of talked a little bit about the AWE sales forecasting and rate model, uh, but I'll take us through uh, a deep dive of it. Uh, so Marianne, if you could go to the next slide. So why did AWE build a new rate model? Well, Marianne covered why we got into this issue in the first place, uh, but typical rate models assume that future sales are known with certainty and don't consider things like price, weather, or economic variability, or things like supply shortages. 
In other words, uh, rate models typically don't plan for the world we live in. And so the AWE sales forecasting and rate model addresses these issues. And so it looks at customer consumption variability based on things like weather, a drought shortage, or uncertain growth. Uh, it also looks at uh, demand response to price. So it includes uh, fairly standard price elasticities that you can include in your analysis to measure the impact of a rate increase and how your customers may respond to that. It also allows you to uh, create rates designed for various stages of drought, so drought pricing, and it helps you plan for those events. And then it also allows you to simulate uh, uncertainty to better understand your revenue risks. And uh, an additional feature of this model is that it goes out five years. So it can allow you to look at a five-year time horizon uh, and understand how your cumulative uh, revenue will look like over five years with your with your rates. And uh, Marianne touched on the affordability piece as well, and it will show you how, to, how a rate change will impact uh, affordability for your residential customer class. So we can go to the next slide, please. Where does the model fit in to the rate setting process? It does not help with capital planning the cost of service and determining what your revenue requirements are or allocating your costs to various customer classes, but it is very useful uh, in rate design. And we'll, we'll talk about all its great features there. So next slide, please. The rate model is set up into, I'd say three primary components. Uh, first is the model setup. Uh, which is required no matter how you're using it. And then it's set up into the rate design module uh, and then the revenue simulation module. And I will take you through each one of these steps uh, and we'll, we'll look at the rate model and, and how you set it up and the feedback you get from it. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please. This is a screen capture of the model setup screen. And this is the first a set of data that the user enters. And the first thing you do is select your bill tabulation year. And we'll look at a bill tabulation uh, here in a bit, but it is essentially a summary of your billing data. So you don't import your entire billing data set, you summarize it uh, using a bill tabulation. And so you select the year of that tabulation, and then you enter things like the billing units of that tabulation. And you can select 1,000 gallons or CCF, or we also have metric units uh, for our friends in Canada and elsewhere. And then you also enter precipitation units and temperature units. Uh, here we have the pretty standard inches in Fahrenheit, but we also have centimeters and Celsius again uh, for our friends in Canada. And then the next entry, uh, you enter your off-peak season. And here in this example, it's October through April. And then the model will calculate your peak season over on the right. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see uh, the rest of the model setup. So at the top, we'd, we have already done our off-peak season. And then in step four, we enter our maximum to minimum uh, monthly production ratio. And the model uses this uh, to determine the importance of outdoor water use in your service area. Uh, number five, you enter your customer classes, of which you can enter six. And so in this particular example, we have single family, multifamily, CII, and a landscape customer class. And then we have two that are not in use. So you don't need to use all six, uh, but you can enter up to six. And then at the bottom, uh, of this worksheet, you enter the median household income uh, to represent your service area. And then last, you select uh, the customer class that represents your residential customers. And so here we enter class one and that's single family. And these two things uh, work with the model to look at the impact on affordability. Uh, next slide, please. So I will take you through uh, the rate design module here and we can move on, but uh, some of the example questions you could ask of the rate design module or address 
it would be something like, what effect would increasing the rate in our top tier by 15% have on water demand? And these are just, you know, hypotheticals. What if we shifted to seasonal rates? You know, maybe we are going to increase the price of water during our peak season. What impact would that have? Would it cause our water consumption to go up or down? Uh, we could also get feedback on what that would do to our revenue. Uh, we could look at what block rate design would allow us to preserve our current level of revenue while reducing overall demand. And that could be very related uh, to the second bullet question. Uh, we can also look at what proportion of customer bills will increase or in some cases decrease under our proposed rates when compared to what we have currently. And then last, how should we adjust our rates to support our water demand management objectives during water shortages? And we'll, we'll take a close look uh, at the drought rate calculator. Uh, so next slide, please. What rate designs can you include in this model? We get asked that a lot. Uh, you can do a uniform rate. Uh, you could do a uniform seasonal rate uh, where it changes for the peak season. And you can also do block rates or seasonal block rates. You can enter up to five different blocks and you can vary rates and blocks for each customer class individually. And as I mentioned previously, there are up to six customer classes uh, that you can enter. So we can go to the next slide. And what data do you need to use the model? That's another question we're, we're often asked. And I mentioned the bill tabulations and you do need a bill tabulation uh, from your billing system. And that needs to be broken out by customer class and by season. So specifically the off peak and peak season. Uh, it follows the AWWA M1 manual uh, and its bill tabulation methodology. And there's a, a screenshot of the cover of the great M1 manual. Um, and when it comes to allocating bills to seasons, it's, it's pretty easy when bills are done monthly. It can be a bit more challenging uh, when bills are rendered bi-monthly or quarterly. However, I've never found an instance where it was impossible. Um, it's, it's certainly possible with quarterly or bi-monthly data, but it, it may be a little more tricky uh, when making decisions about uh, how to define the peak and off-peak seasons. Um, so the bill tabulation, I would say, is probably the biggest effort for data collection, but it's not, it's not that bad. And it kind of depends on how your billing system is set up. So we can go to the next slide. And this is what it looks like when you enter the bill tabulation uh, in the model. I know it, it can be uh, kind of an out there uh, concept, but here's what it looks like. So if we focus on the single family customer class on the left, we can see there's a section for the off peak season on the left and the peak season on the right. And then if we go all the way to the left of the screenshot, we see the usage bin. Um, and there is one for zero. There are oftentimes accounts that get billed for zero water use. Um, and then the list just goes down. And so you enter for each usage bin, the number of bills that fall in that bin and the total usage uh, of those bills. And you do that for each customer class for the off peak and peak season. So next slide, please. And then when it comes to designing rates, uh, you can design up to five blocks and you enter the block switch point. So if we look at the middle column and then the rate for that block. And so that $2.50 is the volumetric rate uh, for the first 10 units. And then the next 10 units are $3.00. And then in units in excess of 20 are 375. The rate model does require you to enter something for each block. So in this case, we've got a three tier uh, rate and we enter the final tier, final block uh, for the last three. And so the unused blocks just have to have the final uh, rate entered into it. And we'll, we'll take a look at the actual rate design module uh, on the next slide. So this is the, the rate design worksheet 
and there's a lot going on here. It's a, it's a wide screen screen capture. So I'd like us to look at the single family section, which is the top uh, set of rows, and you'll see something consistent throughout the rate model, and that's the current rates are represented uh, by the red heading, and the proposed rates are green. And so we've got our, our current and proposed rates entered for single family, and then we've got the off-peak season on the left and the peak season on the right. So that's where we enter what we currently have, and then the rates we want to explore uh, and evaluate. And then on the right-hand side, uh, under the rate performance indicators bubble, you can see that we get our annual sales volume um, and how that changes. In this case, uh, the actual sales volume is expected to decrease based on a rate increase. Uh, and then we get our feedback on annual revenue below that. And so we can see how our service charge revenue is changing. In this case, there were no changes made to the service charge, uh, but we're getting more revenue. Uh, if you see that 18.9 value uh, for the volumetric sales, so we're selling less water in this example, uh, but volumetric revenue is up. And then we can see the total revenue uh, is up 13%. And this is, you know, just focusing on the single family customer class. And then over to the right, uh, there are some indicators that just visually show the impact to sales volume and revenue. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, please. And if we were to scroll to the bottom of, of the previous uh, screenshot from the, the rate design worksheet, we would see what the bill impacts are of the proposed rates. So in the uh, upper left-hand table on this screenshot, we've got the average annual water service cost for current and proposed rates. So again, we've got that red heading and the green heading. And we can see here that under our current rates, the average cost of water service annually for single family is $777. Uh, under the rates uh, that we're proposing or exploring here, the average would be $804 per year or an increase of 3.4%. And then the right side of that table offers median values uh, as well. And then off to the right, uh, we've got our affordability index. And this just shows you how the, the current to proposed rate uh, changes. And it uses median annual water cost and the median household income value that we entered when we set up the model. And then if we look on the middle of the screenshot, we see a table uh, with bill impacts. And on the left-hand side, you see it's got each of the customer classes. And then we can see how much bills war will increase or decrease uh, percentage-wise. So if we, if we look in the middle, we see for single family, 9% of single family bills will be impacted by less than 5% essentially. And then if we go to the right, 4% of single family bills will increase from 5 to 10%. So we get some really good feedback immediately from the model in terms of what those impacts will be. And when you make an adjustment, say you went and changed the proposed rates, you get just dynamic immediate feedback on the impact to revenue, sales, and also these bill impacts. Uh, so at the bottom of this screen capture, we see the single family customer class bill impacts uh, displayed visually in a histogram. So it's the exact same data coming from that single family row uh, in, the, in the table in the middle of this screenshot. So it's, it's a really cool way to visualize uh, the impact. This can be a wonderful communication tool uh, to describe the impacts of a rate change and just offer a lot of insight. So next slide, please. And we mentioned that uh, the rate model will let you uh, design drought rates as well. So it can evaluate rate performance under water use cur curtailment, meaning you're asking your customers or requiring them to use less water uh, if you have a water shortage due to drought. It allows you to design up to four drought stages or specify them rather. 
and you can change the curtailment levels uh, for each customer class so they don't all have to have the same and it lets you look uh, at rate design that you can do yourself manually or by hand or uh, the model has a really cool built-in calculator uh, to find revenue neutral rates uh, for each drought stage and we'll we'll look at that here so we can go to the next slide this is the top of the drought rates worksheet and our first step is to fill out uh, the curtailment levels so that table on the left is what our stages are we've got zero one two three and four and we enter what we're going to request our customers uh, to reduce their water use by. So we've got 10% for stage one for single family. Stage two, things become more severe and we ask our customers uh, to use 15% less water. Stage three, you know, maybe we're getting into you can only water your lawn once a week. We're trying to reduce our water use by 20%. Stage four, uh, we're trying to reduce our water use by 25%. Um, and then in the very bottom row uh, of that screen capture on the left, we can enter our expected compliance levels. So there are some utilities that are unfortunately very experienced of with this and they may know you know we ask for 15 percent but we only expect 80 percent compliance and when you enter those compliance rates you see over on the expected curtailment uh, table on the far right what that would ultimately generate so next slide please and this would be if we scrolled down uh, from that table you see our proposed rates are there uh, this is for the single family customer class and we've got our green heading for proposed rates and then we can look at what if we were in a stage two drought where we were asking our single family customers to reduce their water use by 15 percent um, right now we've got stage two rates and proposed rates the same and if we look over at the annual sales volume table under the drought selector we can see uh, our sales volume has changed by 12%. That's because we are asking for 15% uh, in stage two, but we don't expect 100% compliance. And then we can see uh, in the annual sales revenue table uh, that our service charge revenue is unchanged, our volumetric revenue is down 12%, total we're down 8.3%. So we could adjust these rates under the stage two to make this customer class revenue neutral. Uh, there are a couple ways you can go about it and we'll talk about that on the next slide. So here, uh, if we scroll down even further, is the built-in drought rate calculator. This is one of the coolest things in the rate model. Uh, it uses Excel's goal seek function to find revenue neutral rates. And you can, you can select uh, which drought stage you want. So if you look just under that gray text box where it says choose drought stage to evaluate, again, we're working with stage two here. And we can choose our method for calculating revenue neutral rates. And one option that we see there is to scale rates so that each customer class is revenue neutral. This is one option, but if you do this, you may adjust rates uh, more for some customer classes than others. So another option is to adjust all customer classes uh, proportionally equal. So maybe they would all get uh, the same percentage increase. There's different ways uh, to do it. And then uh, the table on the lower left is really cool because you can say, I wanna leave block one unadjusted and I just wanna adjust block two and three. Uh, you may want to adjust block one, but it, it gives you that option. And that's a great communication tool as well. You could tell your customers, we're not increasing the essential water use block. Uh, we're only adjusting the higher blocks. So you, you make your selections there and all you do is click that find revenue neutral rates button. 
and it uh, completes the calculation and gives you rates uh, that will keep you revenue neutral for each drought stage. So you could use this function just to gain insight and then go further and manually adjust your rates. Um, there, there are a number of ways to go about it, but this is a, a really cool feature. So next slide, please. So the rate design module is great. Um, it does have some limitations. And you see this quote by Sam Savage under the title that says, plans based on average assumptions are wrong on average. And that gets into the theory of the flaw of averages, which we're going to talk quite a bit about today. Uh, the results from the rate design module are only as good as the bill tabulation data. And they can only evaluate how rates will perform on average, or maybe more precisely, how rates will perform given that bill tabulation year. And you get no insight into variability of your rate performance. And that's where uh, the revenue simulation module steps in. So this is where uh, the presentation turns uh, to focus on the revenue simulation module and also the discussion uh, of uncertainty and how this model uh, allows you to assess that. So next slide, please. And you can skip this slide as well. We're, we're digging now into the revenue simulation module. And we asked some questions up front about the rate design module. So here are some questions that are quite a bit different that we could ask while using the simulation feature. And that's, what is the likelihood we'll meet our one-year target or our three-year or our five-year revenue targets under our current and or proposed rates? What is the chance our revenues will turn out more than 15% below our current projections? So we're starting to use words like likelihood and chance. What level of confidence can we have that our sales will exceed our minimum planning estimates? So these questions are quite a bit different and we're starting to think in terms of probability and likelihood. Next slide, please. So I, I mentioned a quote from Sam Savage. Um, and so the concept here is average outcome versus likely outcomes. And the flaw of averages has three primary facts around it. One is that planning for the future is rife with uncertainties. Fact two is that most people are not happy with fact one and prefer to think of the future in terms of average outcomes. I will say when we do this workshop in person, I usually get a lot of laughs out of these facts. Um, fact three is the flaw of averages state that plans based on average assumptions are on average wrong. Um, and there's a screenshot of the book, The Flaw of Averages. It's a pretty easy read for a fairly complex topic. I highly recommend it. It's great. And just an illustration here uh, that was done uh, by our friend Tom Chestnut, who was one of the, the key uh, people behind the rate model, is a unicyclist. We all know people on unicycles don't go in straight lines. But if you took the average of this unicyclist path, it would be straight and it would be perfectly down the, the traffic lane. But its true path is very dangerous. So the cyclist is safe on the average path, but on average, the, the cyclist is in trouble because he's all over the place. So just getting you to think th about this uh, concept uh, with hopefully a little bit of humor. Uh, next slide, please. So another way to look at it or think about it is in terms of weather, because maximum temperature and things like precipitation impact water demand. So here we're looking at uh, precipitation uh, for Bridgeport, Connecticut from 1985 to 2020. And we're comparing the mean, which is the yellow line, against actual weather observations, which are all the blue lines. And you can see if you just plan on that average weather, you're missing out on a lot. Uh, there's huge ranges, and particularly in some of the more important months like July and August, where you're having your, your peak water use. Uh, if you have a cool year, 
Uh, you may have much lower demand than expected if you have a hot dry year. Uh, you may have more. Uh, if you have a very hot dry year, you may get into a drought situation uh, where you're asking your customers to use less water. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a chart for precipitation. So this, this chart's even more busy uh, visually. And again, we've got Bridgeport, Connecticut, 1985 uh, through 2020. And we've got our average or mean uh, by the yellow line. That's nice and pretty flat. It looks, looks like a, a great way to go, but that's not reality. Uh, reality is that there are all kinds of possibilities uh, when it comes to how much precipitation we might get in a given month. And if you look at July or August, again, you know, those summer months can be huge uh, for water use and, and weather effects. You can just see uh, the great amount of variability there. So on the next slide, we'll look at the concept of planning for the future. Do we want to think about the future in terms of a single outcome, like that dot on the left, and just go with a one planning estimate? Or do we want to think about the future as a, a variety of possible outcomes and think about their likelihoods? And I would say we want to do what's on the right. And below we have a very simple and effective quote uh, by Howard Marks, and that is, many futures are possible, but only one future occurs. Next slide, please. We're going to look at two more uh, weather data charts just to drive this point home. And we've got uh, the month of July, again in Bridgeport, and this is average maximum temperature. Uh, we're looking at 1985 through 2020, and the average or mean is 83. And that value uh, would be captured in the bar uh, where we see 84, the yellow bar. Uh, we can see that's not the most likely outcome. Uh, there are a number of outcomes uh, that are possible uh, for July. And we can see 86 is actually the most likely, um, and 84 that bar is eight outcomes. Uh, so it's about 20, just a little over 20% of outcomes uh, fall within that average. So it just kind of shows you again, we have to think about variability and also the likelihood. So this chart shows you not only the variability, but what the likelihood of outcomes are based on historical weather. And in the next slide, uh, we'll look at precipitation. So here we have Bridgeport July precipitation, again, 1985 through 2020, and the average is 3.53 inches. And we can see, you know, it's quite likely that you could get much less than that, uh, two inches. You could get more. Uh, a wide variety of outcomes are on the left and, and right side uh, of the average. Next slide, please. So how does the simulation portion of the rate model work? Well, it focuses on three key variables uh, that are related to short run, run revenue performance. Uh, weather, so you enter historical or synthetic. I know that has a funny sound, weather data, but you could do that if you were uh, looking forward and maybe you had some estimates related to climate change effects and you wanted to incorporate that into the model, you could do that. It also includes uh, growth projections and uh, drought. So we looked at drought and we looked at the drought rate calculator and it can take your curtailment levels uh, that you put in for each uh, stage of drought and include those uh, in the revenue simulation. Uh, you can look at both your current rates and your proposed rates uh, and see how they will perform uh, given uncertainty. And it uses uh, Monte Carlo simulation uh, to run simulations uh, for your rate performance. And we can go to the next slide, please. So the simulation process is that, if we look at this, uh, the model randomly draws five-year weather sequences and randomly draws growth and will also randomly draw drought, either based on your weather data and you indicate if you've had a drought or not, or you can uh, enter whether or not 
uh, you've got different probabilities for various stages of, of drought. So it, it does one trial and calculates what, what the outcomes would be uh, for five years. And it does that anywhere from 10 to 1,000 times, depending on what you specify. Uh, you can do 10, 100, 500, or 1,000 trials. I always do 1,000. Um, it's kind of like a coin flip. You have a 50-50 chance of heads or tails, but you could uh, flip 10 heads in a row. It, it happens, but you'd be really hard pressed to flip 1,000 heads in a row. The more you do, uh, the more you see those probabilities converge uh, to what they are. So next slide, please. Why do we simulate? Why do we want to go to this trouble of filling out this extra data and running the simulation? And that's because the alternative is to completely ignore uncertainty. And this is very common. And that's like this guy over on the right hand of the slide with his head in the sand. You can also construct scenarios, which is a common practice. Both of these options are problematic. Scenarios certainly start to open up to look at, at different possibilities, but it's really easy to inject bias into scenarios. Uh, simulation allows unbiased and very complete enumeration of possible outcomes, but it also gives you a likelihood of various outcomes. The next slide, please. So one of the ways simulation uh, of rates is great is you can connect it to your cash reserve policies. So back in 2018, uh, the AWWA Rates and Charges Committee released a white paper on cash reserve policy guidelines that looked at different types of reserves. And we think this is just a great connection with our rate model. Um, one of the things you can do with the outputs you get on variability of revenue and sales is you can use it to inform uh, your cash reserve policies. And so we have a, a blog post on financing sustainable water uh, on the cash reserve policy guidelines paper and how it connects uh, to the rate model. So I wanted to mention that because it helps make this whole concept a lot more concrete and understandable as we as we go through this so next slide please this is one of the outputs you get from the simulation um, this is sales revenue distribution and so again instead of getting a single forecast a single revenue value you get uh, 1000 outcomes in this chart uh, so we've got the frequency of outcomes on the left and then the horizontal axis is sales revenue uh, in thousands of dollars. And when looking at this chart, it's easiest just to look at one of the colors. So if we look at the green, which is our proposed rates, if you stacked all of those bars on top of each other, they would equal 1,000 because this was a 1,000 trial simulation. And we can see uh, where the results are clustered, we can see where the most likely outcomes are, but this particular community is in a very drought prone area and they've got some pretty big tail risk or risk to the left hand side uh, because of, of a reasonable likelihood of drought occurring. So this can help this particular utility understand their exposure and better inform things like financial policies as well as their rate setting. Next slide, please. So what additional data do we need to run the revenue simulation mod module? We need monthly precipitation and temperature data uh, for our service area. You can enter up to 90 years uh, of historical data, or I mentioned that synthetic weather data that has a funny sound to it. But if you wanna simulate the impact of climate change and you've got maybe a local data source that, that has some forecasts or even uh, forecasts of the impact that you could apply to historical weather data, uh, you could do that as well. And this weather data is pretty easy to obtain and the user guide that comes with the model has uh, various sources of weather data. And that's something I haven't mentioned yet, uh, but 
uh, the model does come with a great user guide. It's a PDF, so you can search uh, any topic you're interested in. Uh, also, you need assumptions for customer class account growth, and you can specify low, medium, high, and you can also, if you want, use no account growth. Next slide, please. This is a screenshot of the weather data entry. So you enter your most recent year, and then on the left, we've got precipitation totals for the month, and then on the right, uh, where it says number three, we enter our monthly average maximum air temperature uh, on a monthly basis. And so it says there you can modify historical weather data uh, for future climate change if you would like to look at something like that. Uh, you need at least 15 years of data. You can enter a maximum of 90 years. More data is better uh, because it gives you a higher uh, degree of, of variability uh, from weather. Next slide, please. So the, the weather effects are calculated uh, based on a weather normalization methodology prepared for the California Urban Water Conservation Council that is now the California Water Efficiency Partnership. And it uses an empirical model uh, that's built uh, into the, the rate model. It accounts for the impact of temperature and precipitation. And this uh, model is completely open source. There's, there's no black box, nothing's hidden. Uh, so you can check out the weather effect coefficients. And if desired, uh, you can even modify them. And next slide, please. I mentioned account growth. Uh, you can sim simulate with or without growth uncertainty. You could enter no growth for your service area if you think that is the path forward. If you're very certain what your growth is, you can enter that. Or if it's uncertain, uh, then you have options to enter low, medium, and high growth rates. So it's pretty flexible uh, in that regard. And next slide, please. And for water use curtailments, again, we, we entered our curtailment levels uh, in the drought rate calculator portion. Um, but we can choose to exclude it from the simulation or we can associate it with our historical weather. So on the weather data entry worksheet for a given year, you could say, yeah, in 1999, we were in a stage three drought and select that. Or you can specify uh, the likelihood of various drought stages. So you could say there's a 90% chance we have no drought. There's a 3% chance we're in stage one and so on. Uh, and so the model uh, lets you do that uh, in multiple ways. Next slide, please. Oh, and here is the screenshot of that. Uh, so here's the where we entered our weather data. On the left is the maximum air temperature. And then if you go over to the right, uh, you can associate a drought stage. Uh, with a given year of weather. So if you look at four rows down uh, at 2009, uh, this particular utility that year went into a stage two drought. And then when the simulation trial uh, pulls 2009 in its sequence, it will give that year a stage two drought uh, demand reduction. So it, it's pretty cool. And I like to think of you know, the simulation trials as rolling dice. Um, but when it rolls dice, it lands on five years of weather data and pulls a five-year weather sequence uh, because we're planning uh, on a five-year time horizon here. Uh, next slide, please. So this is if you don't associate drought with a given year of weather data where you can enter uh, the likelihood of drought occurrence. So we've got 90% for stage zero, 5% for stage one. Stage two has a two and a half percent chance. Stage three, one and a half. Stage four, one percent chance. So here, instead of attaching drought to our weather data, we're specifying the likelihood or probability of these various drought stage stages occurring. Next slide, please. And so once we do all of that, we click a button that says run simulation. Uh, and we start to get outputs. So here we are, our first set of outputs are summary statistics. And let's focus on the proposed rates because there are there's a lot going on here on this slide, but let's look under that green heading. 
and the first thing we get is a table with sales volume and we get five years but let's focus on proposed rates and year one just to hone in on things and we've got our average sales volume from the 1000 trials then we get the standard deviation we get our minimum sales volume and our maximum and then the table below that is sales revenue and we get the same summary statistics so here we can see for this particular utility what their minimum and maximum values were uh, based on the simulation trials and what it was on average and then the standard deviation gives us some insight into how spread out uh, those values are and then let's go to the next slide and we'll check out some more outputs and we've seen these charts uh, but we'll look at them again and we get on the left our annual sales volume distributions and then on the right we get our revenue simulation distributions. We can select at the top what year we want to look at. So here we're looking at the fifth year uh, in the sequence. Uh, and then we can look at this chart and understand our risk and maybe inform our financial policies. We can also understand better what the likelihood is that we're going to meet or exceed our revenue target. Uh, and then if we're seeing a pretty high likelihood of falling short of that, uh, what that likelihood is. Um, so we get a lot of great information from these trials instead of relying on a single output or a single sales assumption or revenue assumption. Uh, next slide, please. We also get confidence intervals, uh, so the user can select anywhere from 50 to 95%. Here we've got 90% selected. So if we look at the top right chart, uh, the green chart in year one, this is showing us that 90% of the simulation outcomes fall within that range and, and within those bands. So if we increase it to 95%, that interval would, would increase in size. And if we went down uh, to 50%, we would see those intervals shrink. Next slide, please. We also get exceedance probabilities. And so this is very useful because we can enter our first year revenue target over there where it says 71,000, which is actually 71 million. Uh, these values are in thousands. And then we can enter our three year cumulative revenue target and then our five year cumulative target. And then over on the right, uh, we can see what the probability is that we will meet or exceed those targets. And so under our current rates on our first year, we're looking at a 45% chance. And then on, under our proposed rates, we're seeing a 93% chance of hitting that target. And then we can see uh, cumulatively over time how that probability changes. And in this given uh, scenario, the probability goes up. There are cases where your probability over time can go down. It, it depends on your rate structure. Uh, so you get some really great feedback uh, on the probability of, of hitting your target. And next slide, please. This is one of the coolest things the model does. Again, it does a lot of cool stuff, but this one really brings the whole simulation to life. And so let's look at the right chart where we're looking at sales revenue. The, the left one is sales volume. Both are very cool, but they're kind of doing the same thing. So let's focus on the one on the right and you see the solid line. That is our average condition. So if we were just planning based on averages, we've got our current rates with the red line, our proposed rates with the green line, but then we can see the simulation sequences and how they're bouncing all over that average. Occasionally, they're, they're getting very close to or pretty much exactly uh, what the average expectation would be, but we can see mostly uh, there's a lot of variability. And then if you look at the horizontal axis at the bottom, those are showing the years of the weather sequences that are randomly being pulled from the weather data uh, to estimate the sales volume and associated revenue. Uh, we also like to say you can use these charts to hypnotize anyone you're presenting to to get the rate structure 
uh, you want passed. Again, that joke would go over a lot better if we were in person. Uh, but I really do like these charts. Uh, you can animate this at the bottom of the simulation output section. And again, it really brings the whole dynamic to life and lets you see what's happening with all of these trials. Uh, next slide, please. The model comes with demonstration data, which is awesome because when you get a blank model, it's very difficult to learn how to use it. Uh, but all you have to do in the overview and instructions worksheet, which is the first worksheet in the model, is scroll to the bottom and click run demo. And it populates the model with demonstration data. It includes all everything for the model setup, the bill tabulation, service charges, uh, volumetric rates. Um, and so you can go through the model and really get a feel for it. And, and the data is very realistic. It's uh, based on a, a utility out west. And so it's a, it's a very realistic set of data. And you can adjust things. Um, you can uh, play with rate design. And it also includes an exercise uh, in the user guide that you can follow. So it, it makes this model, I mean, it's already a free model that you can download and it comes with data uh, so you can learn how to use it. And you can run the simulation module uh, and see uh, the, the different outputs. You can change variables to see what the effect is. So it's really cool. And I highly encourage you to check it out. And next slide. So I'm gonna end my presentation with, uh, with a few more slides looking at different uh, charts for the simulation outputs, specifically uh, the distributions that we get around water sales and revenue. And all these charts are gonna focus on sales volume distributions, but I just wanna ask some questions and get us thinking about these things because these charts, if you're not used to them, can be tricky to work with and interpret. Uh, so what if the likelihood of drought restrictions increases? And so over on the left, we've got a condition. And on the right, we increased our likelihood of drought. Otherwise, everything else is the same. And one of the key things that sticks out here is we can see things start to spread out more and specifically spread out to the left. So if we look at the minimum value on the horizontal axis, we can see on the on the chart on the left we're looking at 3500 and on the right we're looking at 2700 and so our risk for revenue shortfalls increases slightly uh, with an increased likelihood of drought restrictions and so this is just to kind of get us thinking about how things affect the simulation sequence and how the distributions change under different conditions uh, next slide, please. This is uh, four examples of different water utilities uh, throughout the country. And I, I like showing these charts just to say, you know, Marianne in her presentation used one of our favorite uh, responses to a question at AWE, and that is, it depends. And it depends because every water utility is unique and is under a different set of circumstances. And this just goes to show, you know, if you run this model for your service area, and I only showed you the, the charts we've been looking at, you might get something completely different. Uh, so here we're seeing a variety of different risk. You know, the chart on the upper right, uh, that utility has some pretty big risk associated with drought. Uh, the chart on the lower left, uh, we're looking at a much smaller utility, and you can tell that by the values uh, for their water sales. Uh, and this model works for small, medium, large utilities. It doesn't matter. Uh, but you can just see uh, the differences we're looking at here. And I just like to show that variety. Uh, next slide, please. So my final slide and my final question to the group is, what if there was no weather variability, there was no chance of drought, and there was no growth uncertainty, what would our chart look like for the simulation? It would be one single bar, all 1,000 outcomes would be the same, and we'd all sleep a lot easier because there's no uncertainty 
in our world, but that's not the world we live in. So we need to model our rates in a way that factors in uncertainty and looks at the variety of outcomes rather than just planning on one outcome in the future. And so I hope this chart, seeing one outcome based on no uncertainty helps make the other charts uh, make more sense and this whole concept uh, make more sense. And next slide, but I believe that's it for me. And I think we have time for questions for the whole group now. And I thank you for listening. And if we don't get to a question you have uh, today, uh, you can reach out to AWE. And um, again, I encourage you to download the model uh, and the guidebook as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bill. Appreciate your presentation. Certainly thought provoking for many of us. Marianne, would you like to take the questions? Um, sure. Uh, we have Leo McCarthy, who is our uh, webinar master here, who has been assembling the questions. So, Liam, can you um, can you indicate what those questions are? We can all put ourselves on uh, on webcam and answer that for for the audience. Sure. All right. Uh, looks like the first question is for Lori. Uh, they're asking, what has changed uh, from the time when conservation ethics were important in the water industry to now where it seems those ethics have gone away? Uh, and is this an ethics issue among users, water districts, producers, or a combination of all the players involved? So I'm not sure Lori is back with us yet. Um, we may have to defer that question to the end um, because she, she was called away to a meeting with her commissioner. So she was gonna join us for the question and answer period, which by the agenda was supposed to start at 1145. So we're a little early. So let's take another question and we'll come back to that one. All right, sounds good. Uh, here's one looks like for you, Marianne. Uh, in Connecticut, we find that water efficiency and conservation uh, consumers using less water doesn't necessarily reduce the costs. The water company still has to pay for infrastructure and delivery, so they raise rates. How can rate structures for Connecticut water companies like MDC, Aquarian, and Connecticut Water uh, encourage efficient use by aligning positive price signals for consumers? So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that tomorrow. Um, and I, I did mention a little bit of it today in my presentation and, and Bill you can you can chime in here too. But what we're talking about in terms of avoided costs are costs that actually do relate to Connecticut as well. I mean you have avoided variable costs because there's uh, energy cost and chemical cost that goes along with treating a certain volume of water. That's usually a very small avoided cost though that's usually not as significant as say an avoided infrastructure cost. And many utility managers think of infrastructure costs as ones they can't avoid, you know, repair and replace mains. I mean, you can't avoid that. Conservation has nothing to do with that. That's true. But if you find that suddenly your customers are starting to put in all these in-ground irrigation systems to, to water in the summer because they don't want to drag their hose around to water uh, by hand, you will find your peak demand growing. And if you don't have enough supply to meet that peak demand and you have to go and get supply or treatment capacity to meet that peak demand, then that's a cost that you can avoid by doing conservation to bring the peak down. If your system is not growing, and I do hear that from a lot of East Coast utilities, you know, they have plenty of water supply capacity, they have plenty of of drinking water treatment capacity, they sometimes find it's the wastewater treatment capacity that becomes that avoided cost. And I give as exhibit A of this, uh, the city of New York, uh, who avoided having to build an entire second, is this in the years of the secondary treatment plant, uh, they avoided a, a $460 million plant by spending $60 million on a conservation program to replace um, toilets in Manhattan. And by so the conservation program penciled out and was very cost effective because it was avoiding the, the treatment plan on the wastewater side. So it depends. It depends on where your capacity limits might be. If you're over capacity on treatment, if you're over capacity on supply, if you have no problems meeting your peak demand, even if the peak demand were to grow by, say, 20 percent then you're true, your only avoided cost would be your variable cost. Um, 
but we we do find that if you take a closer look you will find that there are going to be avoided system costs new infrastructure growth costs um, the, the American Society of Civil Engineers that does their infrastructure report every year they they like to document where there's replacement infrastructure costs versus new infrastructure costs and there's quite a bit of new infrastructure uh, cost uh, assigned to the Northeast. So it's not the case that it's it's zero. Uh, but Bill, you want to just um, amplify anything there? Yeah, I don't know. That was very comprehensive. And, you know, it is, it's different for every community. So it is worth taking a close look uh, at your avoided costs and what it's going to look like in the future as well. Uh, but I think you covered it, Mary. Yeah, one of the reasons we built this tracking tool was we, we were concerned about making sure utilities could document this with their own system information and uh, so the tracking tool is not like the rate model that one's not free you have to be a member of the alliance but our memberships are cheap and you get it free as a member but that tracking tool does uh, ask you all those questions about how you're going to meet your your system capacity in future years and then what that capacity addition would likely cost and how conservation will compare that because as i say we firmly believe that conservation is a cost effective investment and um, I think you can still do a conservation ethic cost effectively and that's that's part of what we wanted to communicate today. Mary and Lori is back. Oh okay great. Lori we have a question for you. To repeat the question please for Lori. Sure. <laughs> uh, hey Lori uh, so they're asking uh, what has changed uh, from the time when conservation ethics were more important in the water industry and uh, to, to now where they seem to have gone away and is this ethics issue among users, uh, water districts, producers, or a combination of all the players involved? Well, uh, I would say a lot has changed um, over the last 30 years. Um, and I just, I'm sorry that I had to be away for a while, but um, uh, just the, the more uh, frequent storms, extreme events, uh, the pressure on, on drinking water quality, not only on um, extreme event impact that is not very well understood um, or studied in our state. Um, we're reliant upon safe yields that are calculated from the 80s that are in our water supply plans. Those yields were based upon modeling from the 60s, uh, 60s drought. Uh, things are changing. Um, and so, but I think, and when I came out, I was hearing what Marianne was talking about, people um, installing irrigation systems because they don't want to drag their hoses around. I, I think that, you know, the um, the efficiencies of these uh, and the, the, the price of these uh, irrigation systems have come down and are much more affordable these days. Um, and so people believe that um, water should, you know, in our state, Essentially, people still believe that water should be uh, free, <laughs> which, you know, a lot of people don't basically understand how much it costs to bring water to your tap. Um, and we hear constantly again and again and again how the small systems in our state, again, that are not owned by a large system, but are small, they're on their own. They are so happy with themselves to tell us how they've kept their water rates down to almost nothing. But the shame of that is, is that what they don't understand is they have absolutely no money in the bank. And so when a drought comes along and dries up some of their safe yield and they're struggling to find land for another source, they absolutely have no money to do so. So I think that, you know, the ethic, unfortunately, is getting forced upon us. Whether we like it or not, we have to recognize it. Um, you know, a lot of people in the water industry don't like the word uncertainty. Neither do we. You know, we like to have certain yield. We like to have a certain quality. We like to have certainty in supply and demand. And all of this uncertainty in the world is placing more, more and more burden on water systems. And that comes with a cost. So when we see irrigation systems put in the ground, and utilizing all of that wonderful water that we spend so much time and money on to permit, to permit that water, to protect that water, to pump that water, to send it over and down 
tens of miles of pipe only to be irrigated on people's grass. Those times need to change. Um, and so, um, you know, taking a look back at the last 25 years uh, on, on drought is something that all of us in the water industry working together need to think more about. And, and going back to the state water plan is so true that we had an ethic in the 80s because of the 80 81 drought. And so, you know, there's so much more work that needs to needs to get done. So thank you. All right, thank you, Lori. And it uh, looks like a follow up on that. Uh, what types of legislative action might be able to bring back the ethics of water conservation? Well, um, and then Jack can help me with this one too, Jack. Um, there's a lot of different legislative initiatives that, that could be done, um, that it, but it will take a group. It's not just one, one change, I think. I think there's multiple changes that are necessary. Um, there are some, and Marianne has helped us with this, um, looked at the laws that we have. They are all aged, <laughs> like all of us here. <laughs> you know, they're so 30 or 40 years ago that they need to get looked at again and sharpened. Um, and along with looking at policy, and the state water plan actually said that, that maybe the Water Planning Council should be stepping back and at the highest level between the four agencies, um, uh, developing some policies. So Jack, I'll sort of turn some of that over to you. Well, one of the things is that we, when we do any type of legislative change when it comes to conservation or anything having to do with utilities, it's all about educating the consumer. I mean, Bill, you did a great job. Uh, but as I went through it, I'm thinking to myself, we get criticism all the time about people's electric bills and the fact that they, they read like uh, an encyclopedia. So we really have to, if we do any type, type of legislative change, we have to let people know what it means and what's good, how it's going to impact them from a financial standpoint when they when they get the bill. So I, I think that there's an appetite certainly to make some type of changes, but it's it's a matter of you know, how we go about doing it. I think that we really have to make sure that if we get all of our appropriate legislative committees on, on board to do it. Uh, but but this it is feasible, and if, and if people see uh, they're going to get a positive result from it, they'll, they'll embrace it. So, but we have to do it uh, methodically and, and, and cautiously because people will just say, oh, well, here we go again. Uh, there's another charge that's going on the bill. Uh, is it going to go up? And, and we just have to be very, very careful how we do it. And then I'll just add on another piece to that. And, and Jack, uh, you said it very well. Uh, legislative changes shouldn't be taken lightly. They are, and that's why the state water plan really spoke to the need for all of us to get together and look at what Marianne has done with a, with a concerted focused effort. And maybe that's something we need to do this summer um, is to take a look at every piece of legislation that we do have, speak to it, talk about it. Why was it, what was the original intent? What do we need to do now? How have times changed? Um, and and get many more people on board. Because as Jack mentioned, people, customers need to know and be educated as well as, I would say it's so very important to bring local health directors from municipal uh, municipalities uh, to the table. So they're part of the conversation. Um, and chief elected officials of our towns part of the conversation, not left out, not given draft to look at for five minutes before a legislative hearing, and then we get a lot of negative testimony. We need to be inclusive. And that's how the state water plan was put together. And that's, you know, to Jack's point, um, you know, legislation, legislative changes need to be thought through. And, and the fact that last last year, we really had a very bad drought situation in the state. Yes. So I think that we can really build upon that, the fact that, look, we really have to implement some, some conservation efforts here. Unfortunately, we got out of it, but it was really very, very touch and go for a lot in terms of the job situation. So I think that would piggyback on to our efforts here. Another question, Marianne? 
All oh, right, sorry. Liam? Yeah, it's okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it looks like this one is for Bill. Uh, Bill, can you use the rate model to project a low income discount rate? Are there states that have implemented low, in uh, low income discount rates successfully? Yeah, you, you could do that. Um, you could make a customer class uh, that you think might qualify for that rate and you could you could just make that a customer class and design that. And I would say, yes, that has been uh, done successfully. There's a utility we're working with in California, for example, that has exempt rates. And so some of their customers get an exemption and they are exempted, for example, from tier one uh, paying anything in tier one, and then you know their rates are quite a bit different uh, for each tier. So it is possible to do that, or you know it doesn't have to be exactly like that. Uh, any other combination you could think of, you could make it a customer class and model the impact of that. Uh, both get feedback on the impact to the customer bill, uh, the average cost of water service for a year, and then you know what what that would mean for revenue. Uh, as well, so it's it could be done very comprehensively, and it it has been done. Great question. All right, thanks, Bill. Looks like another one for you. Uh, Bill mentioned it's possible to use the model with quarterly billing, although more difficult. Is this true even if the quarters are not aligned? For example, a certain segment of customers build for quarterly use each month. That it can be tricky. Um, so if there's quarterly billing and it's staggered, uh, where it's not all happening at once, you would have you would have to look at the read dates uh, of when that consumption is happening, and how, you would have to figure out how to organize the data. So you may have to do a tabulation of a tabulation, or you know you may have to tabulate uh, your data a little bit differently. Uh, but if you get to constructing a bill tabulation and you have questions, let me know. Um, I mentioned the AWWA M1 manual does outline a methodology uh, in it. Uh, so you could check that out and you can look at how the rate model asks you to enter the data uh, and see how you can organize it. But yeah, it is, you know, the more you get away from monthly billing, it does become a little more challenging. Uh, to do bi-monthly or quarterly, particularly putting it into the peak and off-peak seasons. But I've yet to meet billing data we cannot incorporate into the model. So I'm optimistic that you would be able to make your situation work. And I hope that answered your question. If it didn't, I'd be happy to answer a follow-up. All right, thank you, Bill. I'm not really sure this is something we'll be able to answer, but I'll toss it out there. Uh, regarding Connecticut's three major water companies, what is the status of their cash reserves and what's the easiest way for customers to see this info? And how do the larger companies' cash reserves compare with smaller companies? Oh yeah. gosh, I, I'm assuming that's a question maybe I, for Jack. Uh, I, since we're talking about water companies. <laughs> I, I would say uh, it's, it's a good question, but we're in the middle. That would something to be come up in, in uh, a rate case, which is uh, we have some rate cases going on right now with uh, Connecticut Water Company uh, is in for a rate case right now. And we have a Valley Water Company, and Plainville and Jewett City. We, we have rate cases right now. So that, that would be something that could possibly come up as a question uh, during the rate case. But uh, I would encourage the person to ask the question to reach out uh, directly to the company and uh, to, get the, to get the answer from that. All right, thanks, Jack. Uh, another one for Bill. What accounts for the different range of projections for sales volumes between current and proposed rates in the histogram output uh, from the probability module? Is this due to some built-in assumptions about elasticity of, oops, I lost my place here. Uh, uh, demand in response to cost? Yes, so that is a very good and very detailed question and I will try to answer it completely. So you have your current rates and your proposed rates and on the upfront rate design portion, this I, I don't want to call it simple because it's not simple, but the simple rate calculator or standard rate calculator that's in the model looks at your bill tabulation year 
and then it applies your current and proposed rates. And if you do build in price elasticities, or another way to say that, if you want to assume that an increase in price will reduce demand, you can specify that in the model. And so that is where you get your difference in current and proposed rates for the amount of sales volume, as well as the revenue. But when you move into the simulation portion of it, you're building in uncertainty related to weather effects. That's going to be the, the biggest driver uh, of the outcomes you see. But then you also build in uncertain growth rates year over year. And you can also uh, build in the response to drought. So if you're going to curtail water use or ask your customers or demand of them, require them to use less water due to a shortage, that is also factored in. So to answer your questions, the distributions show how rates perform given those uncertain conditions and the current and proposed rates will be different in terms of you know their reference condition your current rates may produce 10 million dollars in revenue but your proposed rates under the circum same circumstances would produce 12 million dollars in revenue so there's already a difference and then those two rate structures will perform differently given uh, the different weather and growth and, and exposure to drought. So it, it's, it, it's kind of a two-parter, but yes, key to that is how the rates are different. And there can be uh, elasticities built into that. The user can also leave that blank. If you think your customers are completely unresponsive uh, to price, you can specify it that way. Um, and we are going to look at a case study uh, tomorrow uh, with RWA where we applied the model. Uh, with uh, their bill tabulation data, as well as current and proposed rate options. And so we'll dig a little bit deeper into the model and we'll see more specific examples, uh, a more real world example, uh, instead of looking at, you know, screen, well, it will be screenshots, but you know, we're not gonna be just looking at random screenshots from the model. So great question, thank you. All right, thanks Bill. Looks like we have a couple more questions for you. Uh, can you explain how the model adjusts the projected usage-based uh, proposed rates? What does it use to estimate the change in use? So the change in use, uh, if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, is based on the price elasticity function. So you can specify, for example, that your single-family customer class will respond to a price change in the peak season. You could say, eh, in the off-peak season, they're not gonna respond. That's indoor water use. We know our customers, they're not gonna respond, but we think they're gonna respond in the peak season. And then what you get is a slightly lower sales volume, depending on, on how you set the elasticity. Uh, so sales volume goes down, uh, but your revenue could go up. In the, in the example I showed uh, during the presentation, that particular utility, based on the elasticities they used, expected use to go down, but their revenue to go up. And so that the dynamic really depends on the elasticity you set. And so the elasticity says with a certain percentage price increase, demand will go down by a certain percentage. And water is relatively inelastic compared to other goods and services. I often use the lame comparison of candy bars. If Snickers bars all of a sudden became $10 each, we would not buy them probably unless we really liked them. But we need water. We use water every day. So compared to other goods and services, it's inelastic, but it still does respond to price. And so the model comes with some built-in uh, default or optional elasticities that are based on research for short run uh, planning. You know, there's long run elasticities and then there are short run. Uh, but that's, that's the main effect is the price increase and the parameters you set around elasticities. And then when you get into the simulation portion, you're seeing that variability uh, more so uh, resulting from weather, drought, and growth uncertainty. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, has the model been presented to a regulatory body and accepted? I believe it has, but I 
can't say for certain. Um, we build, and Marianne may know of an example that I'm not aware of, but we yeah. build a, these great tools, but they often involve fairly sensitive financial information, and we don't always get full reports back uh, on how they're utilized. But I can I, I can verify that uh, there is a California private water company that uses the rate model in its analyses that it presents to its regulator. It's not the same thing as the regulator approving the model, but the regulator has accepted the analyses that come from the rate model. And and that's a really great question too. You know, I'm talking today and trying to convince people to use the model and model uncertainty, but it takes more than just people using it. Uh, it does take large scale acceptance of, you know, the evaluation of uncertainty and in, in measuring those effects. So that's a really interesting question and consideration, um, you know, for moving forward with this concept is making uncertainty more accepted. You know, people don't want to deal with it. We touched on that in the presentation. Others have said that it's not very convenient uh, or fun, and we're admitting we we don't know the future, uh, and it's that's uncomfortable. Uh, and so, larger acceptance would would be great. All right, uh, this might be one everybody can weigh in on. Uh, can you talk about the impact of revenue decoupling in conservation as well as in the sales forecasting and rate model? Well, that's revenue decoupling is probably a topic that uh, Dr. Beecher is going to talk about tomorrow. Um, but um, and maybe we should save that question for tomorrow. But but Bill, I don't think our rate model deals with it at all, does it? No, the the rate model doesn't really get into that, but uh, in particular. While I have you, Bill, can I can I add a question? Um, sure. The inputs to the rate model are sometimes they sometimes look daunting to utility staffers. You know, the bill tabulation is, of course, one major mm -hmm. thing they have to do. But the weather data, could you just talk a little bit about the the, the cut and paste abilities of, of weather yes. data and where you can get that? Because it, it may seem to people that they would have to fill in every one of those cells by hand, and that's not the case. Yeah. So I mentioned that the user guide will point you to various sources of weather data. And we also have a video on our YouTube page that shows you how to download the data uh, and how to process it for entry into the model. Um, and so once you get it processed in an Excel file, you can just copy and paste it uh, into the rate model. I will go a step further and say, we have downloaded some uh, weather data for Connecticut uh, for our, our case study with RWA. And we downloaded some extra data sets. I showed you some data uh, from Bridgeport, for example. Um, and so if you would like to use the model, you download the model and you attended this workshop, send me an email and I will send you some weather data that's already formatted so you can copy and paste it into your rate model. Um, I, I have a few locations, so I can't guarantee I have uh, your exact weather data, and I'd also be helpy, happy to help you uh, navigate that section. Um, but it is, you know, it's designed to where you can just copy and paste. It's not as daunting as it looks. Uh, the bill tabulation uh, is, like I said, probably the the biggest effort, but oftentimes uh, your IT department can pull that data really quick. It all it just depends on how your your database is set up uh, in terms of how you need to uh, search for that data and pull it. But if you're a small system, it can usually be done in Excel, uh, even with raw billing data. Um, you know, if you're a quarterly and a small system, it's it's pretty straightforward and quick. But again. Uh, you know, if you're attending this workshop and you have questions, uh, you can reach out to me and there's the user guide is very comprehensive as well. All right. It looks like our, our next question is actually also about weather data. So they're asking, uh, how do you combine historical and synthetic weather data uh, with climate change? There's non-stationarity and the historic weather data may not be a good indicator of future weather. 
That's true. That's, that's a very good point. Um, the historic weather data gives us great insight into variability. Um, and if you look, you know, if you get a lot of years, you will see some pretty wild extremes for precip and, and max temp. You know, I, one of the data sets we got was back to like 1949, and you see way different weather uh, than what's happening now. Uh, but that's not to say uh, weather like that won't occur, occur in the future. But you could, if you had an idea of, of what's coming in the future, uh, some expected effects, let's say you expect more rain or less rain, uh, you could take historical weather and adjust it uh, based on what you're expecting. Or there may be a university or other organization that has weather forecasts, and it may not match the format of the weather data used in the rate model perfectly, but you might be able to apply an adjustment to an existing weather data set. And something I didn't say in my presentation that I often do say, uh, it's from Sam Savage, uh, the author of The Flaw of Averages. And when you, when you think about Monte Carlo simulations, we want to get the data as perfect as possible, but it, it doesn't have to be perfect. It, what we're getting is feedback on uncertainty and variability. And the analogy he uses is before you climb a ladder, you shake it. But that doesn't give you the exact feedback you know you need to know if that ladder is safe to climb because we don't shake ladders, we climb them. But to test them out before we climb them, we often give them a shake. Uh, but we're putting a totally different set of forces on that ladder than when we climb it. But we still get useful feedback and we decide whether or not we're going to take that step onto that ladder. So bad analogy, but you, you can modify weather data uh, to reflect what you expect in the future. You could uh, increase or decrease uh, the likelihood of drought probabilities based on what you expect in the future. Um, I mean, with, with the COVID pandemic, I mean, who saw this coming? Um, this is, it, we're in a time where there's unfortunately a perfect example of uncertainty and unforeseen events and impacts. And, you know, drought may or may not increase in your area, uh, but there are probably expectations uh, from, from local folks who have a good idea and have done a lot of study on it. So I do encourage you to, you know, modify the weather data as you see fit. Uh, to experiment like what if this happened you know you can run many different types of scenarios in the model and see well, what if our probability of drought goes up uh, from 10 percent to 20 percent or, or whatever it may be so i encourage you to get in there and experiment All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, looks like one for you, Marianne. Uh, is there a case study on the Manhattan Toilet Exchange Program you described? Um, I have to think back because this this goes back to the mid '90s when New York experienced this. I think they wrote it up for a case study for the Environmental Protection Agency. They published a report, which um, you know, if you send me an email, um, I can dig that out for you because I think it's documented there. Uh, it was published uh, on the mid '90s, um, you know, conservation case studies. Um, but the city of New York is happy to share information about it as well. The Department of Environmental Protection in New York is actually the water uh, supply planner, and uh, they were the ones at, at the time that worked with the, the wastewater agencies in New York to to do a conservation program instead of needing to build another facility. But we do see the wastewater treatment limitation being uh, a factor in water efficiency in a lot of utilities uh, east of the Mississippi. West of the Mississippi, it tends to be water scarcity in the supply. East of the Mississippi, it tends to be more capacity and treatment capacity rather than supply since many systems have, have adequate supplies. But the peak demand and the growth in peak demand coming from these automatic irrigation systems, it's not something to um, to take lightly. Uh, water utility managers are becoming, at first they get happy because they're making all this money and then they realize that they're rapidly outgrowing their, their peak capacity. So that's that's one of the areas we, we look at carefully and the, the tracking tool, uh, as well as the rate model, both take a look at the peak versus on peak uh, consumption. 
So if you send me an email, Marianne at a the number four w e dot o r g, I'll uh, I'll send you that uh, EPA report. All right, thanks, Marianne. It looks like this one is for Bill, but um, Jack and Lori might want to weigh in too. Uh, given that the Connecticut investor-owned water companies have a revenue adjustment mechanism to adjust Pura allowed revenues to actual levels annually, would that alter your thought process on projecting usage with the model? I don't know that it would. Uh, in terms of, I don't think it makes the exercise unnecessary. Um, and you know, I, I'm not familiar with the ins and outs of the rate adjustment mechanism in place, but uh, I don't think it takes away from the need to evaluate uncertainty. And again, you can take those outputs that you get uh, from simulation and compare them, or you know, look at your financial policies in place and see how that fits in or how that factors in. So I don't. You know, not being on the ground there, I can't speak uh, to the issue uh, very well other than I don't think it, it takes away the importance of understanding uh, uncertainty in your system uh, for sales volume as well as revenues. And we'll also talk more about that tomorrow. And I look upon it, you know, over the past couple of decades, we've come up with many different tools, if you will, in, in the water world. The water infrastructure conservation adjustment charge with, with the, the RAM. We've come up uh, with many different uh, programs or rate programs to mitigate uh, rate impact and rate shock to consumers. So this would be another vehicle that would have to be vetted by us and, and uh, to look at it and get everybody to weigh in on it before we, we would implement it. So it would be another alternative for us. All right, still have a few more questions here. Uh, are there some qualification factors to the, determine who is eligible for the low income rate? Additionally, would an inclining block rate help with uh, a longer tail block to solve for that issue? So I think that's going back to, I mentioned there's a utility that has exempt rates. And yes, they have uh, qualifying factors for that. Um, I don't know them off the top of my head, but uh, typically rates, uh, if, if someone has an exemption, uh, there's some qualification for it. And if you are going to subsidize one set of customers, you're going to probably have to pass that on to other customers. Could that be done uh, with an inclining block rate structure? Possibly. Uh, the rate model would actually be a great way uh, to evaluate how you can balance your revenues if you are going to introduce an exempt customer class or have a rate structure for a specific set of customers based on either economic or other status. Um, so the rate model would be a great way to look at that and you could probably work it out. Um, can you do it within your regulatory requirements? That's another question. So you would have to keep that factored in uh, for cost allocation to the different customer classes and those rate blocks. Um, those are just things to consider. Uh, but yeah, the rate model would be a great way to explore uh, different options. And my email address, since it's not on the slide, is bill at a4we.org. So B-I-L-L, -L, followed by the at symbol, the letter A is an apple, the number four, we dot org. Um, I know answering these questions on the fly, I maybe don't always hit them perfectly, so feel free to follow up with me uh, afterwards, or I can get you a, a, spe a specific example of something. All right, thanks, Bill. Uh, another one for Lori or Jack. Uh, in Connecticut, is there any requirement for a water utility to include capital improvements in their water rates? Absolutely. I mean, when we do a a, a rate case, capital improvements are always uh, part of the, the rate setting process. Uh, we also have, as I, I mentioned earlier, we have the uh, WICA, the Water Infrastructure Conservation Adjustment Charge, where they can come in, water companies, private investors can come in between rate cases and give us projects that they uh, consider to be used and useful to come in and uh, we have a, a, a 
ten percent cap limit between between rate cases. But again, it's something that we did through the legislature some time ago. Uh, it passed the legislature unanimously with the support of the Connecticut Consumer Council, and it is an, another vehicle to to mitigate uh, rate rate shock for uh, consumers. So just to just to add to that, and I don't know if you mentioned this previously, but when Jack speaks about WICA and rates and oversight, there's Quarian, Connecticut Water, Jewett City, Hazardville, Torrington. Those are the rate regulated utilities in Connecticut. The the municipals are not rate regulated under Pura. So there's quite a few um <laughs> Of the 80 that are um, serve over a thousand people, many of those are not Pura rate regulated. Correct. All right, thank you both. Um, this is actually the last question that we have right now, uh, so we'll see if one more trickles in. But uh, they're yeah, asking. We have a good crew out there asking questions. We like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it looks like that's for the AWE team. Uh, affordability is such an important consideration for a utility today. What does AWE consider to be affordable uh, water rates as a percentage of median income? Uh, and given investments that might be required for increasing conservation, how best to address in the current pandemic environment? That's a great question. And, you know, affordability is an incredibly important topic. We in the model right now have a median household income indicator uh, and that gives you some immediate feedback on how your rate change uh, will work with with the variable of median household income and median water usage however uh, we as an organization are doing a lot more work on that topic and we're exploring other affordability indicators uh, that have been put forth uh, in a paper that was prepared for AWWA. Uh, it's called the Household Burden Indicator and the Poverty Prevalence Indicator. Uh, those two indicators are, are combined to then describe uh, affordability burdens in a given service area so you can get a, a better understanding uh, of your customers uh, and how they're affected. And, you know, I think a lot of our work focuses on the role water conservation can play uh, in empowering customers to lower their bills. Uh, you know, if you're billed volumetric, volumetrically for water and sewer, uh, what are strategies uh, that water utilities can undertake uh, to reach customers uh, that may be struggling to pay their bills and lower their water use and we did some work uh, with the city of detroit looking at the current state of affairs there and looking at uh, the ability of water conservation to have a meaningful impact on bill reductions and so that's where a large part of our focus is right now uh, so we're you know like like everyone else drifting away uh, from the median household income indicator and looking at other measures of affordability and trying to push the conversation forward it's a it's a it's a big challenge um, and we're trying to come up with concrete uh, results and strategies to better understand it and uh, you know take effective strategies with water conservation i don't know marianne if you want to add anything to that well i i think you should mention the detroit report and the how yeah. we basically looked at affordability, but how water efficiency did have a positive impact on yeah. the affordability of those bills. Uh, and that's a report that's downloadable from the Alliance website. Um, and I, I think it was a surprise even to the city of Detroit uh, what the results were that we came up with in this report. So it is an important issue. We recognize that. Yeah. And there's a, a webinar uh, on our YouTube channel as well uh, as a report that you can download. And it's it's very enlightening. Uh, we had someone from the city of Detroit uh, speak to the issues they're facing and the challenges they're facing. Uh, they in, in their city, they've got a very old housing stock. Uh, so there are a lot of homes with leaks and older fixtures and appliances. So there's a great opportunity there. Um, I also see economic opportunity by getting folks, uh, you know, actively replacing these things. So if they can get uh, some outside funding, either from the state or federal funds, uh, to invest in uh, retrofitting these old homes, they could generate potentially a lot of jobs. That's another topic 
I would I would like us to look into uh, because you know the water utility is delivering water to its customers and there are certain economic conditions that vary uh, from service area to service area and I think it's not in our wheelhouse but it's an important part of the equation is how do we generate more economic opportunity uh, because you're weighing up water affordability you're looking at the price of water against people's incomes and it, you you could make water almost free and in some cases it would still be unaffordable so we we need to look into uh, economic opportunity and how we can spur that uh, with investments in water conservation as that's you know that's related to our work we can't go off in too many directions uh, with economic development but I do uh, see a role uh, for you know investments in conservation and efficiency for generating long-lasting jobs uh, in some of these places. So, so we did have uh, somebody ask about uh, where to access the workshop materials. Uh, Marianne, I don't know if it's easy to flash that link on the screen again, but um, if anyone didn't get them, they can also feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is liam, L-I-A-M, at a4we.org, and I'd be happy to send them out to anybody who didn't see them for some reason. Yeah, we, I can I can show everybody right now. Here's the Financing Sustainable Water webpage. So you just type in Financing Sustainable Water, all one word, dot org, and then you go to the Implementation tab, and then you see Connecticut Rates Workshop right there, and you just click on it, and there the materials are all there. Uh, the rates model is not posted there. You'll have to get it from the website itself. You go back out and just click Rate Model, and it'll walk you through. Uh, you know, setting up and requesting the rate model and getting it from, uh, from Bill. So it's all on this website, financingsustainablewater.org. Okay. Well, I thank all of the panelists uh, today, the presenters, Marianne and Lori and uh, Bill. I think it was a great uh, presentation this morning and thank the participants and uh, thank LAM for fielding all the questions today, and um, we're all set to go on to day two tomorrow at 9 a.m. and have more exciting uh, discussion with the uh, presentation from uh, Dr. Jan Beecher and uh, from Maureen Westbrook, and we're going to have a panel, and then we're going to hear from Bill again, and then we'll have questions and answers at the end. So uh, I thank you all very much. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, water's been a passion of mine for the past two decades, and uh, always learn something new, and that's the whole purpose of this uh, workshop today. So we are uh, adjourned, and uh, as we say in the uh, regulatory world, we will continue this until tomorrow. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Great Bye. questions.